lovely panel yet again. Carson Williams, Reagan Ledbetter, and Ken Adair. Gentlemen, how are we doing today? We're doing great. It's perfect weather out here. Another another Saturday of college football. It's not a hot morning no, in the it's summer. Not. It's a, a nice, just cool like a nice, cool breeze. Fall is morning. in the air. Fall yeah. means football. Yeah, I yeah. love it. Yeah, yesterday was a lot of wind. Today it's not that bad. Nice yeah. little breeze. Yeah, nice. Great day to be outside doing uh, your show for the first time. It's going to be hot today, though. Yeah, well, but right now, it's right fun. now it's great. Yeah, I mean, fair enough. Fair look enough. at the view behind yeah, us. That's why I we're mean, doing this in the morning. Yes. Good call, Carson. For now, it feels very good outside. And what a way to start off our morning. But we have a whole lot in store today, gentlemen. Are we ready to get into the oh, show? Yes, I've, we are. I was born ready. All right, I'm looking forward to it as well. We're going to start off, as I mentioned earlier, it's week three in college football, which means naturally week two just wrapped up. Yep. I want our thoughts uh, on week two, something that stood out to you. Carson, I'm going to start with you. Well, for the for the past couple years, you know, the, the first year of the college football playoff, the Big 12 got left out, and since then they've kind of got a bad rap. Mm -hmm. OU's big win last week at Ohio State kind of catapulted the, catapulted the Big 12 back into relevance. And the Big 12 as a whole, sans Baylor, and you'll touch on, on this here in a sec, yeah. <laughs> but the Big 12 as a whole, I think, has, has held its own weight this year. TCU last week had a good win at Arkansas. Uh, so top to bottom, I think the Big 12, and, and I, and I kind of talked about this a couple weeks ago, I think the Big 12 isn't the worst conference. I think the ACC is, and I think the Big 12 uh, is steadily improving, and I think that there could be a lot of teams in the top 10, top 15 by season's end. I'll tell you what, we're, yeah, like you said, I'm going to mention Baylor. Is Baylor really this bad? I think they are. Honestly, Liberty? <laughs> you, go down to, you go down to Liberty and UTSA at home? That's rough. Joey Galloway picked you to win the Big 12. And he's still holding to that. And he also <laughs> said Baker's not a good passer. How he, he said he hasn't made any, any tough throws. How he still has a job, I don't know. He's also I picked really Alabama know. to be number two after beating Florida State. But, but, so I don't know about that guy. But for real, I mean, <clears> it's just killing the Big 12 right now. There's already, they're already kind of the laughing stock of, of, of college football as like You're a right. Power 5 conference. And then you have Baylor going out here and losing to two very, very small schools. Now they're going to Duke this weekend. Mm. I'll tell you what. They're going to make Duke look like a football school <laughs> after this weekend. You yeah. know, I think I think hey, the next— David Cutcliffe's a good coach. Yeah, but Baylor's just that bad. I'll no, tell you I what. Know. The next three games for the Sooners, you have Tulane today. You have Iowa State or uh, Baylor, Baylor next weekend and then Iowa State. Right. Baylor's the worst team of those three. Oh, no doubt. They are really, really bad. Going through a quarterback They might be worse well. than Kansas and Iowa State. Exactly, and who would have thought that going into week four, Baylor will probably be 0-3, and, and after week four, they'll be 0-4 more than likely. Yeah. I think the thing that stood out to me was the, the other big games last week weren't really that big of games. Georgia versus Notre Dame really didn't do anything for me. It was 20-19, to 19, I believe, mm -hmm. was the final score. There wasn't really any excitement there. Right. And then you had Clemson versus Auburn. The score was 14-6. to 6. It was yeah. more <laughs> of a baseball score than it was a, a football Ball score yeah. and so it's the a high scoring baseball game. Exactly. Yeah, well, really. I mean, you know, I'm just <laughs> saying, I, was, I said closer, not like it actually <laughs> was. Hey, we've seen some high baseball scores. You know a lot about that, that's sir. That's true. That's but it, true. it just it just didn't feel like those games met the standards right. yeah. like we expected them to last week. And I was a little disappointed, mm -hmm. especially in Clemson, when you've got such a high powered offense. Mm -hmm. to not step up and do what we know them to be able to I will accomplish. say Auburn and Clemson both have very good defenses, but as yeah. far as Georgia and Notre Dame, both of those programs right now are going through a little bit of a rough patch. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know. I, I Downhill think spiral. That, I think hopefully that game's a big, a little bit of a wake-up At least, At least that. college football had a little Ohio State OU action to, to tie them over for a, for a week, too. Yeah. yeah, they did. That was a big, big game. Boy, did that game save that weekend. Heck <laughs> of a game, too. We'll get into that in a little bit. What stood out to me, Oklahoma State, can you play somebody? Please. For real. <laughs> I've got a little <laughs> list for you guys. I think you guys are going to enjoy this. In 2014, Oklahoma State took on Florida State and lost. Since then, teams that they have played in non-conference include teams like Central Arkansas, UTSA, Southeastern Louisiana, Tulsa, South Alabama, and, of course, Central Michigan. Which, Ooh, by the way, Mike Gundy still lost. believes they won that game. <laughs> hey, do not knock on UTSA. Obviously, they got a big win for their program last week, so they're they're on an uphill yeah, Baylor's spiral. the Baylor's the favorite to win the Big 12, yeah. and they yeah. beat them. Bob Bolsey might be making a call to UTSA and say, hey, come join the Big 12. Yeah, we'll expansion we'll replace, is suddenly we'll Baylor. Yeah, we'll exactly. replace Baylor. But that, that is shocking to me because Oklahoma State comes into every single year with such high expectations and high-powered offenses, and everyone wants to see what they can do against true competition. But year in and year out, they fail to schedule teams that really live up to that potential. And then the high expectations continue to exceed. And we don't know how to value Oklahoma State at this point in the season, which is pretty upsetting because you mentioned earlier the Big 12 carrying its own weight. Well, Oklahoma State is viewed to be one of the top two, if not the top team in the Big 12. 
we really don't know where they're at. And today they'll be playing Pitt. We'll get into that a little bit later. But it's tough because Oklahoma State consistently does not try to schedule games that will bring national attention to them. And next thing you know, well, you've I got think a, we overestimate them. You've got to hold Mike, Mike Holder to that because mm -hmm. as their athletic director, he makes those decisions, mm -hmm. and year in and year out, he continues to <laughs> schedule these second tier, third tier, however you know, yeah. however many tiers you want to go down, he schedules these weak opponents, and mm -hmm. that's that's on him. To be honest, I think that's the reason why, a, a huge reason why the Big 12 gets so much flack for being kind of the worst of the Power 5 conferences is because other than Oklahoma, no one in the in the Big 12 schedules anybody for the first three weeks. Mm. They really don't. Oklahoma has had, you know, Florida State, Notre Dame, Tennessee, and now Ohio State. And UCLA. And Army. UCLA next year. You got Army coming Houston, up, too. Houston, Nebraska Last coming year. up in a couple of years as well. And yeah. Michigan down the, down the road mm -hmm. more. But other than that, n Baylor, we've talked for years now about how Baylor plays the worst teams to start their season every single year. And that's why over those few years, a few, uh, three years back, they were kind of the talk of college football being the mm -hmm. best team, but it's because they don't play anybody. Now it's coming back to bite them. And yeah, yeah exactly losses. now it is. Now they can't even beat the teams that they should beat. Mm -hmm. well, you, well, you see a few teams here and there, like TCU faces Arkansas every now and then, West Virginia faces Virginia Tech, but they don't face those top 10, top 15 programs like OU has, like you said, in the past couple of years. So I think to like really give the Big 12 more respect, they've got to start really putting themselves in that position to at least play against better teams mm -hmm. like teams in the SEC and like teams in the Big Ten because that's the only way you're going to gain the respect you deserve mm -hmm. from the voters. To, to, I mean, to argue again, I mean, on their side of the, of, the, of the coin, you have like a team like Oklahoma State or Baylor. A lot of teams schedule out opponents years in advance, and at the time they were good, mm -hmm. and then when they play them, they aren't that good. Right. But look at who they're scheduling. They can't even use that excuse because no. – Central Michigan. None of those teams UTSA, were ever good enough to begin with. Liber li who knew Liberty even had a football team? <laughs> so Baylor found out. In a hard yes, way. <laughs> they did. Man, that's they're still Ooh, hurting down in Waco. That's too soon. I'll tell you what. Over forty <laughs> points in Waco. Keep in mind, that's rough to take that big of a was, loss. I think it was what forty-eight, almost mm -hmm. fifty points given up at home. That's next brutal. week. Whenever Oklahoma marches into Waco, that could get. It could Real be 70 ugly. to nothing. It, I would not surprise me. Well, we're talking about big-time scores. Let's make some bold predictions. Coming into this week now, week three, should be some exciting matchups, but also some opportunities for some surprises. I know everyone here has a bold prediction for this weekend. I'm ready to hear them. Carson, let's start with you. We'll get into this game uh, here, in a, here in a second, but I'm going to go Clemson, Louisville. I, I think Lamar Jackson could rack up about 450 total yards of offense against. <laughs> that's not a Stout bad D. day. <laughs> no, it's that's certainly that's not about a bad what he's day. Well, for right him, now. That's, exactly. that's a normal. But day. but normal but day against him. Clemson's defense, who might be one of the best in the country, that's going to be it's going to be a lot tougher for him than it usually is against what he's played so far this year. Um, I think he's due for a big day mm. and is going to be neck and neck with Baker Mayfield for the Heisman contender. That's a bold prediction, today. especially with Clemson's defense. That defensive line to me is one of the most yeah. dominant. Yeah, and I'll, I'll touch football. on that in here in a sec, but I think I think Lamar Jackson could have a big day. Okay, so. mine's, mine's quite the bold prediction. Um, our sports Oklahoma. advisor, Barry Orr, kind of laughed when he, when, when he saw it. Uh, I'm saying Pitt is going to upset Oklahoma State today. At Heinz Field. At Heinz Field, where my Steelers play. <laughs> Oklahoma State. Your Steelers. Oh, your Steelers. Oklahoma State travels up there today. It's an 11 o'clock kick. I think it was a close game last year. It was an eight-point game down in Stillwater. Mm -hmm. Oklahoma State just got past Pitt. I think that it's going to be Matt. Oklahoma State has not played anybody yet, and they've kind of had I mean, a very, very weak start to their season. This is going to be a trap game. Yeah. I think Pitt's going to come ready to play. It's They're still hurting from last year's game. They, they were so almost, close. So close. Yeah. Almost beat Oklahoma State in right. Stillwater. They're going to be hungry. They're going to yeah. want this win. I think I think if there's a, there's a – today's a chance for them to do that. You mm -hmm. know, my bold prediction isn't really so much for today but for the entire season. I've talked about him so much. He plays for OU. He's the D.E. Or you can say he's a linebacker, Mr. Oboe, or like he likes to be referred to as OBZ. Mm -hmm. yeah. I Great see nickname. him – being an All-American by the time the season is over. I see him having another big game. I wouldn't be surprised today if he has at least two to three sacks this game. Wow. And possibly ten tackles. Don't be surprised if he's in the backfield a lot today and for the rest of the he, season. He's, he's on a path to be one of the top or premier pass rushers in all of college football. I'll say that is a pretty bold prediction because Tulane runs a triple option offense. It's going to be tough to get to the quarterback. Like we've seen from Georgia Tech and stuff is mm. going to give a lot of fits mm -hmm. for someone who hasn't relatively seen it often. Mm -hmm. I, w I do like 
yours, Reagan. Max Brown, the grad transfer from USC, going to give Pitt a chance. Yep, Max Brown from my home in Washington State. He went to Skyline. I think it was a three years, three times state champ mm. up there. One of the biggest things to come out of there. Um, I'll get more into that later on. but Absolutely. You as well. Good stuff. My Thanks, bold Cole. prediction is a team we touched on earlier, Notre Dame. They take on the Boston College Eagles today. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you right now, Boston College will upset Notre Dame today. It's a big-time prediction. But keep this name in mind, Harold Landry, six foot four, about 250, 260 pounds, led the nation last year in sacks with 16 and a half. This kid's a stud. His arms, I swear, go below his knees, maybe even straight to his feet. He's going to disrupt the pocket and cause young Brandon Wimbush to be a little disturbed there. I say keep, at, keep an eye out for them. Also, when that Boston College offense is going, that rush attack that they have, it's hard to get the ball back. And John Hillman today, the running back, he could have a big time day, especially with Notre Dame's defense kind of in question. And to be quite honest, I think Notre Dame as a program is reeling right now. The Fighting oh, Irish yeah. don't know how to handle themselves. That's what I was going to say. Is it really an upset? <laughs> I talked about that on your radio show. <laughs> the way they're playing. Ago, how, yeah. how, you know, they're not they're, – they're, I think they're the most overrated program in the country. They haven't done very much recently. I think they have two 10-win seasons in mm -hmm. the last 20 years. And last time we saw them in the national championship, they took, 2012. Up, we took up a rough L to Alabama. <laughs> Since then, they haven't done much. So I would say don't be surprised if the Boston College Eagles upset, no, well, I'll say upset in quotation marks. But I think if that rush offense holds the ball away from Brandon Wim Wimbush in the Notre Dame offense, and then Harold Landry applies pressure to young Brandon Wimbush, could be a tough day for Brian Kelly and the sure. Fighting Irish. That's what we have for our very first segment. But next up, we're going to Around the Nation. We break down games every single uh, time zone in our great country. And we're going to start off with the game we mentioned a little bit earlier, gentlemen. Clemson at Louisville. This game, 7 o'clock on ABC out there in Louisville. It's going to be an interesting game. Obviously features two top-tier quarterbacks. But we're going to talk about that after this break. When we come back, we're going to preview that game and more. You're going to want to stick around. Welcome back to Game Day U. As I mentioned earlier, we're about to go into Around the Nation. We break down games all across this country. And we're starting off with that game I mentioned earlier, Clemson at Louisville, an ACC showdown, boys. Two top-tier quarterbacks, big-time interesting defenses. Should be a fun game today. Potential to be either a lot of points or a low-scoring low game. We don't know, but let's see what we think. Carson, I'm going to start with you. I'm going to go back to last week. Clemson. Their defense had 11 sacks against Auburn, yeah. and that's a high number. That's mm. That you know, just solidifies the fact that Clemson's defense, especially their defensive front, is very good. Last year in this game, Lamar Jackson had a pretty big day in their loss. He was, he was so close to getting them the win. He was 27-44, 295 passing yards, one touchdown through the air. Also had 162 rushing yards and two touchdowns on the ground. He's going to have to be special again today mm -hmm. for that to happen, and I think this is going to be a big matchup in the trenches. Clemson's D-line against Louisville's offensive line, and I, I think agree. Clemson's de uh, uh, defensive line is just too too good, too big. Absolutely. Louisville's pass, pass protection is atrocious, and Clemson's defense, I think, is going to take full advantage of that today, and I think Clemson this takes this one. This is a true battle, Lamar Jackson versus that stout Clemson defense. Right. Like you said, 11 sacks last week against Auburn. Clemson has not given up a touchdown yet hmm. this season. They are very, very good on the defense side of the ball. But Lamar Jackson, they have to contain him. He's averaging 505 yards per game, 385 yards through the air, and he has back-to-back 300-yard -back passing and 100-yard rushing games. He does it all for that, for that team. If you can take him out of the football game, you have a automatically a better chance to win that football game. You know, Jalen Smith is a guy to watch as well. 70 catches, 300 yards already. One of the top leading receivers in all of college football. 17 receptions in, in two games. <laughs> 17. <laughs> Throw to somebody else. Clearly Jeez. that's the guy Lamar is going to. But it just goes to show, Lamar Jackson is, I mean, he's a Heisman favorite. He's a guy who can do it all. He can, he can get you through the air, but he also can get you on the ground. And if Clemson can stop him, it makes them really – one-dimensional because they got they don't really have to do much other than just contain him. And they so take the ball out of his exactly. hands. Exactly. So I think it's going to go down to if, if Clemson can do that, Clemson's going to win this game. But if Lamar Jackson has one of his days that we've seen in, in, in past year, 
it, it could be yeah. a long day. Well, you mentioned that Louisville's offensive line protection is atrocious, but that's why they need a guy like Lamar Jackson that's because yeah, right. he can do so many things, whether it's through the air or whether it's on the ground. And you talked about how great he is, averaging over 500-plus yards a game. But I'm going to go to the other, so other side, to the other QB, Kelly Bryant. This is a yeah. young guy coming in, didn't have a really good game. You like last Kelly Bryant. Week. I really like watching him play. Even though he was he he won the game for Clemson last week. He was the only one to score two rushing touchdowns for them. Needs to get better with through the air. I think for me, if Clemson wants to have a chance, we talk about their defense, I'm gonna talk about their offense. I think they have to have a complete offensive day. Yeah. Not just passing the ball, but rushing, I blocking. I think to give this young guy a little bit more confidence. Mm. The D-line, we know they're gonna play well. We yeah. know the defense is gonna play good for Clemson. So I think it's either gonna have to, what it comes down to is whether or not the Clemson offensive team can step up completely or yeah. the Louisville team on defense does it. You know, I agree with you, and we talk a lot about these defenses, these offensive lines. I want to point out a position group that really goes under the radar here, and that's Clemson's wide receiver core. They are stacked, gentlemen. Deion Kane, Hunter Renfro, the young man that caught the game. Hunter yeah. Renfro, yeah. national yeah. championship, the walk-on. Clemson on. continues to have NFL caliber talent in the receiving core, and they almost slide under the radar because of the quarterback question that constantly surrounds them. I, I really think that if Louisville's defense doesn't come prepared to face up against a guy like Deion Kane, who I think might be one of the top receivers in the country, he's a freak of nature out there. If they don't prepare to cover this guy and have some sort of bracket coverage or double team prepared, it could be a rough day for them. And Kelly Bryant could be real comfortable real early. That put Louisville in a tough spot because the last thing you want to do is have Lamar Jackson play from behind yes. where he has to air the ball. Exactly. Out. And it would be a tough day for Louisville and we've if seen Deion Kane and those receivers catch plenty of passes. And we've seen him struggle in big games. We saw him in the bowl game last year against yeah. LSU. He was absolutely terrible. Mm -hmm. Against Houston, he didn't really play well. So when he get, I mean, he had a really good game against Florida State last year. But for the most part, when he has to step up, he truly doesn't. I haven't seen – I haven't been too impressed from him so far. I mean, it's another big game for him. And, and if he can step up, they have a chance. But here's the problem with Lamar. He's that quarterback that if he is able to run the football, he's a great passer, mm -hmm. meaning that he's comfortable so he will find guys to pass to. That's why his numbers are so high. If you knock out his run game and his ability to scramble around and do what he does best – He's not a good passer. Yeah, you limit him to be a pocket limit, passer. You, you like limit Jason him, Barrett and he is, he is not a pocket passer. The Sooners last week did that against JT Barrett, yeah. a guy who likes to run around and throw the ball late. If you limit that, you see what happened. You're, you're one hop and eight yard passes as a D1 quarterback. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing happens. Even, Lamar ja even though Lamar Jackson is a, is a top quarterback in, in all of college football, mm -hmm. he's still not a guy who's just a number one passer. Yeah, right. he, he just puts up a lot of yards because, you know, he's able to. Mm -hmm. get away from guys. All right, we're going to move on to the next game. And this one, Sooner fans will probably be sticking in on a little bit. Texas at USC. Last time, if I remember correctly, these two teams played. It was a little bit interesting game. Hmm. Kenny, I think I think you are a pretty big fan of that game. Now these two teams come in, to be quite honest, in an interesting stage in the program. Texas bringing in Tom Herman, lots of hype surrounding him. But they've gotten off to a little bit of a rough start. USC, Sam Darnold, they didn't l perform as they would have wanted to against Western Michigan early. Had a better performance against Stanford. Two teams coming in now. A lot of question marks surrounding this game. Who's going to come out on top? Your thoughts, gentlemen. I think this is all a big game for Texas. I think so. Can you start one and two? Personally, I don't know if you guys agree with this or not. If Texas can go to USC and beat them, that erases that loss to Maryland. I think it honestly. Maryland. Honest, Maryland. Maryland. Thanks. It honestly, I think it's it, early. It's early. <laughs> Calm down, boys. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's early. I'm it's, sticking it's, up for you, it's, man. It's, it's that Maryland. north. It's that northwest accent. It's that accent. Northfield. That it's Northfield. That, yeah, beg. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think that honestly can erase that that loss. I mean, I all agree. the focus is still back on that week one loss to them, and um, to Scott Van Pelt's favorite team. We'll say that. We'll call him. We'll call okay. him that. There you go. So I think that it's a big game for Texas, and if they can go in there and do that against a number four team. But to me, it's about how these teams are so like evenly matched on offense inside of the ball. I mean, te Texas 548 yards per game, mm. USC 572. Texas had 406 yards on the ground last week. Yes, they did. 406 yards. So this is gonna be a battle of run games. Be, that was against San Jose State. <laughs> hey, yeah. Look what they did against Maryland. I mean, I think that you know it goes to show that they're they need to do well against anybody right here? now. Yeah, here, hey, we'll thanks, Carson. I appreciate it. Yeah. I appreciate it. The wind's blowing. Yeah. We're in Oklahoma. It's a little breeze. We already touched on that. We're in Oklahoma. All right. Talk well, about your favorite Texas team. 
favorite Texas. That's hard to really say if, if they're my favorite Texas team. You but love Texas. You talked we about know the, you, you do. talked about the running game. That was led by Chris Warren. He had about 166 yards last week, if I'm not mistaken. That played a huge factor in last week's game, and it's going to have to play another huge factor if they want to have a chance against USC. Mm -hmm. Also, quarterback-wise, Sam Ellinger, I want to say that's how you say his name, he had a sure. decent game. He controlled the pace, yeah. really stayed comfortable in the pocket, and showed his maturity, mm -hmm. even though the, the, what the maturity that he had. I don't know if Texas is going to win this game. I really don't because well, I don't blame got, you. There's a, yeah, <laughs> I know, I know. You yeah, aren't alone. The you aren't alone there's, on I, this. I'm not the only one, I guess. Maybe there's a lot of questions surrounding whether or not they can step up and be that Texas team that yeah. we all grew up knowing them to be. Mm -hmm. USC, Sam Darnold. I don't know what USC team we're going to get. Are we going to get the one we saw against Western Michigan, or are we going to get the one that we saw last week against Stanford? Against Stanford? Yeah. Yeah. That's the question. So if 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 Sam Darnold's going to have four touchdowns, or is he going to have two interceptions and 150 yards? That's the question. Another thing, I don't know if y'all have been watching the commercials, but no. seeing them show the Rose Bowl 20,000 times to preview this game is absolutely annoying because the, the <laughs> hype around the same. it is so <laughs> not – that was one versus two. This is four versus like 110. Shane Michelle, Vince not, Young, Shane Michelle, Vince it's, Young. It's, neither it's team has been good. Neither, it's, yeah, neither, it's, neither, it's neither team has been same. good since that game. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's not that exciting. Since that game, the hype around either program really hasn't been there. So it's yeah. kind of annoying watching. Watching this, them flicker yeah. to every shot of Vince Young, every every view of Vince Young yeah. running into the end zone to win the game, and I'm just like, yeah, it's not happening today. I it's, believe it's I believe this happening. is their first sellout for USC since 2013. Mm. A Sweet. lot of Texas fans are coming into town. For me, I think it all depends on if Shane Shane Buchel plays or not. He has yeah. that that injury on his uh, right throwing shoulder. This could be a game I think Texas could really let loose. They've got really no expectations coming into today. Uh, going in to USC, into the Coliseum, big game. Mm. They can really let loose. But I just – I don't take – Texas doesn't have it. Like, we, we've kind of already yeah. touched on it. But I don't think anybody's confident I think, in them right now. I think, I think Texas, since this is kind of such an underdog story for them and they have no chance to win, I think this is going to be a game where they kind of keep it close. Sam Darnold has had trouble – keeping control of the ball, has four interceptions already through two games. Yeah. Uh, so Texas is going to kind of hang in with them for about three quarters, and mm -hmm. then I think in the fourth quarter, Sam Darnold and USC are going to take over. And it's yeah. going to seem a lot more lopsided than the score actually shows. I think my key for this game today is actually the defenses of each team because whoever can rattle the opposing quarterback early on is going to have the advantage in this game. Turnovers will be key. If you can keep the ball in your offense's hands, it's going to be tough, obviously, for your offense to score efficiently. And if you can't put up points on the board, I think whoever manages the turnover ratio and establishes themselves on defense will have the advantage in today's game. We're going to move on to an SEC showdown, gentlemen. And I know a lot of people on this panel are not excited about this game. But I don't I know about showdown. Who, who are you referring to? Uh, I'm talking about <laughs> Tennessee and Florida, 2.30 on CBS. Man, TV right Woo. there. Uh, this is normally a pretty big rivalry game for those two schools, but I think everyone here on this panel – probably with the exception of me, yes. is not you're excited the, You're the only game. one who's excited. So, gentlemen, your thoughts. Kenny, I'm going to start with you. Gators and Volunteers. Oh gosh, why well, start with me? Because you I know, know what you're going to say. On my first, this is my first statement of this game. This is a game of mistakes. <laughs> 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 uh, honestly, Way my, to hype it up, my, Kenny. Yeah, I'm sorry. You're really getting our viewers but excited <laughs> for the game. Uh, Tennessee, I think they've scored 42 <laughs> points in both games, uh, each in, bo in the first two games each. Mm. Florida, I'm not excited about watching them. The quarterback position, I don't know. Zaire or Franks, who is it going to be? You know because you're a huge Florida Gators fan. I couldn't tell you who's going to step up for this team. Like I said, it's going to be a game of mistakes. Whichever team can make the least amount of mistakes, I think is going to be the team that wins because it's, it's going to be one ugly football game to me. I don't see any excitement coming from this game except for maybe the last 10 seconds when whichever team realizes they're going to win mm -hmm. just starts jumping around. But one quick stat, Florida hadn't played since they played Michigan two weeks ago, and they yeah. got they lost. They had 11 yards rushing in that game. He took it from me. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. Not, not a lot's out there. Not a lot to take out of those games. <laughs> yeah, so. not, not a lot. So there was a lot of negative, so I yeah. thought you'd have more to give. 11 yards rushing. Yeah. You got to do something better. That's like a, that's a first down. You got yeah, a first they, down. You got one first down. Nice. <laughs> they Michigan got a lot of pressure on the quarterback. Yeah. I think he was ne had negative nine, like minus 19 yards. Yeah. He got sacked a lot, and if they can't do anything about that, 
they're going to have a lot more trouble against this Tennessee team. I don't team, blame though. you. This is, a, this is one of those games, like, I mean, I have two teams that are, you know, hyped every year to be, this is their year to get back in it. And then every year it's like, eh, never mind, they're not that good. So let's fight for the SEC East. Okay. And that's what today is. And All right. It, this is a big game for the SEC East. Just um, yeah, lagging Col on the Collins, game. Collins hate me right now. But Florida, they have a good defense. I mean, they hit. Thank they, you. They had. They had Finally, someone makes a point that I, I can get behind. They had two <laughs> pick sixes against against Michigan. Back-to-back -back possessions. Which kept them in the game. Yeah. So if there's a highlight to Florida season so far, it's the fact that they have two pick sixes, probably more touchdowns on defense than they do on offense and probably will have today mm -hmm. on offense. Um, but, yeah, like you said, just a m mistakes. And you have guys up in the air. Franks. Is it Felipe Franks or is it Malik Zaire? Yeah. We don't know. Franks is getting a start today, but he hasn't done much as a quarterback. Zaire did all right coming yep. in to replace him after um, uh, Franks fumbled in that Michigan game. Yep. But who's it going to be? Um, you know, I, I think we've, we've bashed on this game enough, so I think we need to let Colin um, kind of, well, you know, Carson, bring, well, bring it well, get something in real quick. Okay, so you – Oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Uh, you go know, ahead, I just wanted to make a quick more, one more bashing statement. Okay. You know when you watch a football game and it's raining and muddy and it just looks like terrible football? This game's going to be that just without the horrible weather. Yeah. That's just what <laughs> I'm <laughs> saying. <laughs> it's going to be like, oh, good stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff. Carson. Okay, okay. We're, not, we're not done bashing Florida real quick. Uh, okay. All right. So, 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 so Florida's favorite in this game. Keep it coming. And I have absolutely no idea why. Okay. Other than the fact <laughs> that it's in Gainesville. Man. Because of their uncertain status at quarterback, which you kind of already touched on, whether it's Felipe Who Franks is it? We don't know. Or Malik Zaire. Um, and with the offense as a whole, mm -hmm. and you kind of touched on that a second ago, l l listen to this. Tennessee has scored 11 touchdowns in their last 20 drives. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're Tennessee, all you have to do against Florida is score points. If you can manage to do that mm -hmm. against their defense, win. You well, won. You, well, you won. Unfortunately, I'm being told we have to move on, so I can't go off on my <laughs> little rant here. But uh, <laughs> keep in mind, if Florida can assess themselves on some win in the swamp, but we're going to move on. Gentlemen, we talked about these two teams a little bit earlier. Reagan, you mentioned Oklahoma State and Pittsburgh, 11 on ESPN. Interesting here. Oklahoma State finally playing somebody. That's what I have right here. Hey, what? OSU finally playing a power five team. So what happens today? Well, okay, well, I'm going to go back to last year, and we kind of already touched on this. 45-38, Mason Rudolph had a big day, 26 of uh, 46, 540 yards through the air, two touchdowns. And James Washington, nine receptions, 296 yards, and two touchdowns as well. That's going to be – that's not what OSU wanted last year. They're going to – OSU's offense is, is, the kind of, is the kind of offense that makes you spread out your defense, um, and that spells bad trouble for Pittsburgh because even if Pitt does find a way to contain the passing game, you're not going to stop it, but you're going to have to try to contain it as best you can. Justice Hill is there in the backfield, and he's, bec he's slowly becoming a good running back for Oklahoma State. So – the prob I think the I think the big thing is is OSU is going to have to try to establish their run game against Pitt uh, to try to you know keep them on you know up so that way you know Mason Rudolph can just fire to James Washington to Jawan Seals just anybody who he can get out there deep. I think um, you know this comes down to these are two quarterbacks Max Brown and Mason Rudolph were actually two of the top quarterbacks coming out of their out of their um, high school Very same time right. they, they were the two top guys uh, Max Brown went to USC and. And Mason Rudolph went to Oklahoma State. Obviously, Max wow. Brown now at now at Pitt. But you know, this is you know Pitt's Pitt's pass defense is ranked number 80 in the country. Mm. But Oklahoma State, as we said before, they look really good. But a lot of that is just Mason Rudolph to James Washington every single game. Yeah. If you can stop that, it really really limits Oklahoma State. And I think that if if Pitt can fo zone in on stopping James Washington. Mason Rudolph, his second guy is probably Chris Lacey. I mean, that's probably his second guy. McCluskey, Tyron yeah. Johnson, and their receiving core. They're both – they're all very fairly talented. But they're – they I think, I think they're they're have the best, they, have the, yes. they have the best wide receiving core in the country now, I think. Yeah. Yes. Other than James Washington, I think, they, as a whole. They do, but it, it's kind of like with, with OU. I mean, no – oh, man, that's a party foul right there. Party foul. Oh, yeah. well. Anyways. Coffee and you're spilling it on yourself, it, too. It, it will. It, the show will go on. But anyways, I mean, James Washington is just – He's, he's their guy. It's like D.D. Westbrook here last year. If you can stop him, you know, mm -hmm. I think that Pitt has a chance. And that was the point I was going to make. They couldn't – no one could stop D.D. last year. And I don't think it's going to be the case for James Washington today. I think right. we all touched on it. James Washington and Mason Rudolph are going to have a big day. I see right. five touchdowns from him. Are you going to finish that? <laughs> uh, it's it's well, when we go to commercial. Well, Carson's yeah, we'll gonna, uh, Reagan's gonna try and dry <laughs> his pants off. But we're gonna go to a quick break, and then coming up next, we're gonna join our studio team in Gaylord. They're gonna have a little bit more on stories all around college football. Stay with us.
What's going on, guys? Welcome back to Game Day U. We are going to be your in-studio crew for the day. I'm Josh Calloway, William Sule, Spencer Royce, Kyle Payne. Guys, how are we doing today? Good. Fantastic. Doing all right? It's another football Saturday, right? Of course. All right, guys, so let's get into some national stories here. Uh, we'll start off in Florida. Georgia Tech, Central Florida, we're going to play this weekend down in Orlando. Game was canceled because um, of Hurricane Irma. Uh, what are some thoughts about that? What we got? I think for UCF, it's not a good situation because football is a huge revenue stream for schools, and they lose a whole home game. But for Georgia Tech, it's good. They looked slow in their second game. They only came off the six days. So both teams are – they have different views about it. But I think for UCF, they had a chance to get a Power 5 win. They are losing that money, so they're definitely upset that the game's canceled. Yeah, it's a much bigger exposure game for a school like UCF. But as he was saying with Georgia Tech, two games in six days at the end of their second game started looking very hobbled, started looking very just slow. And so now they can kind of like rest their wounds and figure it out and get that bye week. So that's good for them. And I think with the National Guard using Spectrum Stadium as a base to like help hurricane relief efforts, it wasn't really going to happen either way. And with the rescheduling of the Memphis game, it's not a huge blow to UCF as a whole. And like he said, Georgia Tech could have used a break. And so I think overall, it's not a huge blimp in the college football radar. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Georgia Tech, they played their first game against Tennessee on a Monday night. It was Labor Day night. They ran 96 offensive snaps in good that point. game. That was a good game. Great game. Went to, I think, double overtime. Lost off a two-point conversion. Yeah, crazy game. Very long game. They turned right around, played in just six days against Jacksonville State. They looked very sluggish in that game. Then they would have came around this week, played in Orlando, probably like the 70s, 80s, very humid. I mean, this is a game that's really a no-win for Georgia Tech. They're the favorites, obviously. They're the Power 5 team. They caught a break. I mean, obviously, you don't root for hurricanes, honestly. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but they caught a break not playing this game. You don't have to root for hurricanes. They caught a break. They're not in the national championship race. There's nothing to gain here other than a loss. It's such yeah. a lo It's a tough situation yeah. for Georgia Tech. So moving on to other not great news. Brendan Vaughn, Ohio Oklahoma State linebacker, only 18 years old, was arrested and dismissed from the team earlier this week for possession with intent to distribute within 2,000 feet of a school. Um, he was, like I said, dismissed from the team, had more than $2,000 worth of marijuana in his room. Pound and a half. Pound and a half. What do we think about that? It's just a bad move for the school. It looks bad for them. It looks bad for the player. I mean, he admitted that he, was, he had intent to, to sell it and... You get caught, you're done. I mean, that's it. Yep, you're going to have to switch out that red shirt for an orange jumpsuit and oh, nice. get all that figured <laughs> out because that's that's definitely a criminal offense at a pound and a half. You only need, I think that's like yeah, 30, like he's 30, a serious 30 grams or something. Yeah, it's like 30 times what you need to go to jail. So he really did, did a little bit extra with that. And he went to court on Tuesday and pled not guilty despite finding the police coming in and finding all of this evidence in his house doesn't really make sense to me. But at the same time, he's a three-star prospect, redshirting this season. For the future, and really for right now, it doesn't hurt OSU's playoff hopes in the long run, but definitely not a good thing. Well, let me ask now. you this. Let me ask you this. It's kind of an elephant in the room kind of question. Do you think that if the NCAA was paying the players, as a lot of people think they should be, if he would feel the need to sell drugs, you know, it's probably, in his mind, his best, easiest, fastest way to get money. Do you think that NCAA is paying him that he would do that? Would he even get paid as a red shirt not playing? I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure it's how it would work. I feel like pretty much any player on the team would be getting something. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'd i hope that... You're still if, getting a lot yeah. of time to the school. I, yeah, I mean, I hope that he would know that he shouldn't sell drugs anyway. I hope that he would know that maybe this isn't the right thing to do and maybe talk to someone who also isn't getting paid because none of them are getting paid. So maybe, hey, what do you do to get money that's not going to put me in jail? Can you help me out and give me some ideas? But, yeah. There are always other options. No, I, I, I would hope you would think NCAA of a more honorable way. There's no way that that's the only way that Brendan Vaughn had a way to make any money. Start mobbing on eBay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there are ways to get money besides dealing marijuana. No, I was gonna, I mean, there's probably a lot, there is, a lot more honorable ways to earn money. But at the same sure. time, you know, this is a guy, he doesn't have free time. You know, he's a D1 college football player at a major program in Oklahoma State. You know, I, I can't help but think that, you know, he's getting paid for his time. Maybe he doesn't do this. I mean, theoretically, yes. And that is one of the many proponents of paying college football players is that they need more than they're given. Yeah. But at the same time, 
come on, man. Like, do you really need to be selling drugs at your dorm room? Like, if you're really struggling that hard, like, go talk to somebody, get some help. Like, there's other ways to if, get around. If he's not getting paid by the school, but he is getting paid by the school. He gets to go for free. Yeah. Athletes get tons of free stuff. Free food. I know that they're not paying for him to play football, but he's still getting more from the school than he would have been if he's not playing football. So, If you're blessed enough to become a college athlete, do not throw it away. Absolutely. Yeah. For sure. All right, so staying in the Big 12 on a more positive note, not people getting arrested. Yeah. Um, the Big 12 is actually, I think, getting a little bit of recognition this, this past week or so. Obviously, Oklahoma beat Ohio State. Huge win. TCU went into Fayetteville, beat Arkansas. They look good, too. Oklahoma good. State and Kansas State haven't really played anybody, but they've looked good so far. West Virginia, even though they lost Virginia Tech, has looked pretty good. Most people consider them a good team. How do you feel the Big 12 sits right now going forward, playoff, committee, wherever? I think especially adding the championship game, we're not going to be looked at as a conference that people just look over. There's five power conferences, four spots in the playoffs, and it always seems like the Big 12 is the one that everyone wants to count out immediately. Been left out twice. But Three I don't see, I don't see that ones. happening this year. There are two teams in the Big 12 right now that look like they could play in the playoff. K-State looks good. West Virginia looks good. Don't say with TCU. I mean, you know. Yeah. There are five good teams in our conference, and that doesn't happen in a while. Yeah, and who knows what Texas will be by the end of the year. If Tom Herman's a great coach, you know, who knows where he'll get them. Um, you know, obviously teams like Baylor and Kansas and Texas Tech hurt the rep of the conference, but every conference is bad teams. Especially Baylor. Yeah. Every conference wow. is bad teams. The Big Ten, yeah. you could argue, has some of the worst teams in all of Power Five. So uh, it definitely. Yeah. The Adding the championship game is obviously the biggest factor. You get that extra point with the college football committee. Now you're looked at as a serious contender, and you don't have to just hope you have an undefeated season with the championship game being added. And with OU, TCU, and West Virginia, and all these schools that are actually playing up, and then K-State's D-line giving some defensive presence to the Big 12 and how OU played on the defensive end against yes. Ohio State. Defense is obviously something that has been looked down upon in terms of the Big 12. And so now that they're on the upswing with that, it just kind of completes everything and just shows that the Big 12 can put out a contender this year to win it all. Yeah, I really feel like the Oklahoma-Ohio State game really might have done shockwaves throughout college football, that a Big 12 team would go into Columbus and just look so much faster, so much more physical. I mean, that really, especially with the way the game went last year in Norman, where it was the op complete opposite. So, huge win for the Big 12. So, what do you got? And I think a lot of these storylines come Big 12, SEC. It's always been the storyline the past few years between Bob and Saban, all these things. And with TCU's pretty much shut down Arkansas, at Arkansas, 28-7, to 7, only 267 total yards for Arkansas's offense. K-State last week, granted it was against Charlotte and wasn't a very good team, but they had two defensive touchdowns. The Big 12's defense is getting headlines, which is something you haven't seen in the past five years or more in the Big 12. OU's defensive performance has obviously been talked about a whole lot in the past few weeks or this past week as, as general, but TCU's playing well on defense. OSU's defense is yet to be tested, but it shows potential from last year. I think it's a big flip of the script for o o the Big 12 and OU in general, especially. Come college football playoff time, come committee time, that defensive presence is going to be a huge plus in our category. I think the Big 12 getting recognition and all the teams playing well means that when OU starts to move down their schedule and we start winning or OU starts winning more games, it's not just going to be about the Ohio State win. Yeah, absolutely. We're, OU's going to have quality wins against. Five teams possibly, and that's going to look great. What did Lincoln Riley say playoff. this week? This will not be our biggest win. That's what Lincoln Riley said. All right, so talking going off the Ohio State game, the topic all week long, the thing that everybody wants to talk about, the Baker Mayfield flag plant. Legendary. Where do we feel? Is everybody in agreement that it was awesome? How do people yeah. feel about it? Oh, yeah. I think it's something that will be iconic in Norman for the rest of forever. Like, it's one of those moments, like, when you hear about – other places in college football, like you always hear about, like when Peyton Manning conducted the Tennessee band against Alabama. Yeah. People in Alabama still, to this day, hate Peyton Manning, someone that most of the country just loves and adores because of that one moment. And that's something that OU is going to have against Ohio State, a history now. And it's something that's already turned into shirts, turned into like just moments on campus, and people just love it. People okay. talking about the flag plant, if he wins the Heisman, being up oh, on the, the statue. statue. Yeah. Oh, that would be awesome. That would be the best Heisman statue of them all. There's no way they do it, but it would be legendary. No, yeah, because they're actually, Jokes Leone has 
dismissed it. They're not going to use it in any kind of OU promo videos mm -hmm. or anything like that. It's so school is kind of yeah. trying to separate more of a yeah. PR move because I think yeah. everybody actually loves it. It's yeah. definitely been the most iconic moment of the college football season so far and it has potential to be like the most iconic regular season moment at least for the entire season. And it's just cool to see just all like the revenge he felt like in his heart from last year just going out and proving not only to himself but to his team that what happened last year is done for. It's a new team this year and they can just go in and get it done and just planting that flag and staking your claim not only as I'm the man in Ohio today, but I'm also the man going forward and this team is going to be the team that gets it done. Kind of just staking your claim on the season like this is ours. I love that when you watched Baker do it, it didn't look like he was doing it for show either. He was pumped up. His team got a huge win. He led him to one of the biggest wins in his whole career. And that's what he wanted to do. And the whole team loved it. He loved it. I think every OU fan loved to see it. But, I mean, it's controversial to put it right in the middle well, me, of the field. Let but. me say this right before we get out. Me and my dad were talking about it earlier this week. Shout out, Dad. I know you're watching. That it's fine. And we, everybody in OU loves it. But we have to know. Sooners Nation has to know. TCU, whoever comes into Norman and beats OU, and somebody goes and flag plants the OU logo, can't say anything. God, I can't have a double standard there. Can't be hypocrites about it. Yeah. All right, so that's going to be all for us for now. We will be back later on. We're going to toss it back out to Colin and the guys out at the residential colleges. They're going to do a four downs next. We'll see you back later on. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Well, obviously, we talked about this is a huge win for Lincoln Riley in the Lincoln Riley area. Second game, already a signature win. Let's see what the coaches had to say throughout the week about the big win and what we can expect from Tulane. Excited about the chance to play Tulane this week. Know a lot about their head coach, Willie Fritz. Uh, have a lot of respect for the, the man he is, the coach he is. A uh, ton of success at his different stops. Very familiar with him at Sam Houston, um, Georgia Southern, some of the places he's been as up here lately and has always been successful. Um, always an athletic team. They're, they're still playing very well defensively, just like they were there our last few, few years uh, at East Carolina. Um, they, they, they fly around. I think they only gave up 500 yards twice last year, which is, again, very, very difficult to do. Defensively, they're going to definitely stress us with a, uh, a spread option attack. Um, it's not option in the sense of like you see you know, with Navy and some of the military schools, but it's a, there's a lot of option-based uh, rules to it. Um, be a lot of assignment football for our guys. It'd be something a little bit new and uh, something that we're going to have to do a good job of handling. So we're excited to be back home. Uh, would fully expect that, you know, Saturday night, you know, Norman will be, will be really rocking. Should be a great atmosphere, and, and we're excited to uh, get that one teed off and get moved on. You know, Coach Biedenboe's kind of created that culture, you know, within our offensive line that that's, that's what's expected. Orlando's been one of the guys to lead the charge on that. But that, that group is uh, – that group definitely is, is on edge all the time, and, uh, and they play like it. All right, guys. So as I said before, we went to Lincoln there. This is a huge win. Signature win for him in just his second game. So how big is this win for the, the Sooners? I mentioned Big 12. How big is a win for Ohio State? Right? Huge, right? I don't think it could be bigger. I mean, sure. Unless it was maybe Alabama, Ohio State is a huge program. Nobody thought OU had a chance to win that game going into Columbus, especially after the game last season. But they tore it up. Like, it was a huge win for OU. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, from basically the, the start of the game, you could tell that Oklahoma is good enough to play with these guys. You could yeah, tell right away. The energy. Yes. I think it was 85% of professional analysts had picked Ohio State to win. It might have been upwards towards 90. And it just showed on the field, like, who had more heart. And going forward, it just puts – OU in the conversation immediately for a national title contender, obviously. And it lets everyone know, like, this is a team that we can't mess with. We have to go in and we have to treat them like they're one of the big names, one of the big Final Four teams that we could see later on. And they'll, they'll be in the conversation the entire year if they move through the Big 12 as, as we intend for them to do. And honestly, it gained a lot of national respect. 
Like, there were a lot of people like, OU was a, whatever, top 10 program coming into the year, but no one was really talking about as a serious title contender. It was the opposite. You know, most of the preseason shows and stuff I saw was that OU wouldn't win the Big 12. OU was not as good as their ranking. So yeah, exactly. Called pretenders. Yeah. And I think that can easily be shed now. Like, no one's going to call the team that goes into Columbus so. and whoops Ohio State a pretender. So I think what it really ended up doing was gaining a lot of national respect, but with that respect comes a big old target on our backs. Every, I mean, it was already going to be there, no matter yeah. what, within the Big 12. But for the rest of the year, Baker Mayfield and that offense especially will have a target on their back because of the flag, fl flag planting yeah. on top of the fact that they just whooped Ohio State. I think this win is also huge for Baker Mayfield and his chance at winning the Heisman because people didn't think Baker was going to have as good of a year losing Joe Mixon, P. Ryan, and D.D. Westbrook. It's hard to... It's hard to find people to replace that production, but he's gotten a ton of people involved. If Jeff Bidette and Trey Sermon didn't fumble in that first half, we could have been up. Oh, yeah. By yeah absolutely. It, it would not have been No, you could tell that OU was in their own way a little bit yeah, in the shot, first they half. They shot themselves in the foot the first time. Several times. And sure. I totally agree with what you were saying, that outside of going to Tuscaloosa and doing that to Alabama, there's pretty much nobody better you could do oh, it yeah. to in but, Ohio State. Like one of the most storied schools in all of college football for the history of college football. Absolutely. In the shoe, a super young OU team goes in there and just plays their hearts That's out. That's what impressed me the most. People. The play of Trey Sermon, Jeff Bidette, because you know he's from Kentucky. He really hasn't been in any huge games. These guys who all haven't played in that kind of atmosphere literally in their life, going out there and just balling out like that. And I think it proved to people who, along kind of your point, Baker Mayfield doesn't need weapons around him to be great, especially not experienced weapons. He came he in with great. a completely new offensive set around him and is still putting up what 16 of 17 for 200 some on yards in the second half yes like that's incredible absolutely and we were talking about you know how much the win meant for the program this game got baker mayfield i mean i think most oh, yeah. he's generally i think the consensus best quarterback in college football right now he's looked like the best player in the country oh yeah sure. yeah if the heisman vote was today obviously it's very early in the season two weeks in Got just as good a chance to win the Heisman as anybody. Baker, I think not, he would. Baker not having the weapons that he had last year, I think, actually helped his case if he's still oh, putting absolutely. up these numbers. Sure. Yeah, they lost so much. And that was a big reason why so we were called, OU was called pretenders, everybody else, because everything they lost, complete rebuild, replacement, which was absolutely sensational. All right, guys. So, obviously, I said signature win for Lincoln Riley, just his second game. He still got control of the offense. He still calls the plays. But who had the better day, him or Mike Stoops, who's been kind of on the hot seat, taking a lot of heat the last few years with how poorly the defense has been. Defense played great. Who had the better day, Lincoln or Mike Stoops? I think you got to go with Lincoln Riley. And shouts out to Mike Stoops for all of the defensive effort. But that offense dominated from the first snap. It was all over the place. They were very well balanced, run pass, obviously leaning on Baker and his experience in the passing game. But you never really got the sense that they were redundant. Like, they were doing something, but it was always different. You never knew what was coming. And they always kept Ohio State's defense on their toes, worried about what was coming next. When you only have to punt one time at Ohio State, that's impressive. And granted, there were turnovers, and that's not ideal. And the offense stalled in the first quarter and couldn't really get going in the first half to score. But they were very efficient, well-called game, and I think you've got to give it to Lincoln Riley in this one. i got to agree about Lincoln. He chose the game plan. They stuck to it, and it worked. Mm -hmm. They went into the game. They knew they had to get the run game going, but against Ohio State's front, that is hard to do. Well, the play and calling was sensational. The direct snaps, the Dimitri Flowers plays, the read option passes, the play calling was Perfect from the very get-go. They used all of their skill players in all of the different situations they could have. Jeff Bidette's speed, Kyler Murray's speed, and his ability to also throw. Trey Sermon's youth, but also speed. Like, they used everyone they could have, and it wasn't just like a Baker Mayfield show. Spence, we got. I'm going with Mike Stoops. Lincoln Riley's not on a hot seat right now. As we all know, Mike Stoops Absolutely. was. Absolutely. His brother, the head coach, Bob Stoops, is gone. So a lot of people were saying... How long is it before they get rid of Mike? They don't need Mike anymore. Bob's gone. He's not. The family ties aren't there. Mike put on a stellar performance through his defense. His defense shown, and that was that was the question mark. The offense really isn't something that's been in question. Everyone knew that Lincoln's an offensive specialist. He's a mastermind. He can come in and put together packages. But Mike Stoops' defensive abilities have always been something that OU fans. Uh, Blog, like bloggers, people that talk about OU have been talking about as being the downfall of the program. And him doing this 
and showing that his defensive skills and the team skills can match up against top two, top three team in the country on paper, that's that's more impressive to me than Lincoln Riley carrying through with something that he was doing last year. Already. I agree with you. I think Mike Stoops, he was coaching for his job this year. Bob's gone. He doesn't really have any protection now. There's no reason for the school to stick with him. The defense was as bad had this been the last couple of years. So, final non-con game today, obviously, for the Sooners against Tulane. Uh, what are you guys looking to see tuned up? What, what's, what can they work on get better before they go into Big 12 play? I'm looking to see our running back group be more decided. I'm, I'm anxious to see what guys get the most car carries today. And going into conference play, we have four backs who have all played pretty well. And going into conference play, it'll be exciting to see if it's Trey Sermon, if Rodney Anderson's going to get more run today. Abdul Adams, besides the fumble, it looked good in the first half. So I just want to see running backs look good today and get going quickly. Kyle and I were actually talking about that before the show, how we need to get uh, OU needs to get the running back depth sorted out. They need to figure out who's going to be their number one guy going forward because the running back by committee obviously does have its perks and it keeps your running backs a lot, their stamina higher and things like that. But having a definitive back that you know you can rely on going forward through the season mm -hmm. is obviously something sure, sure. that will help you just be more dominant because that's the guy you can rely on going forward always. And OU always has a one or two feature back field. We know that, that, that workhorse, that yeah. workhorse, Murray, Peterson, Mixon, Pierre, always. And I, the thing I want to see most is the Kyler Murray package. We really saw it kind of in a small dose against Ohio State, a little bit against UTEP in the second half. But I think that could be a big key going forward to get yeah, a new absolutely. mix into our offense. And it didn't work as effectively as I think it could have against Ohio State. A lot of the things in our offense worked great. But that package in particular could be improved, and I think it could be a huge boost to our offense going forward. OU fans are used to things like the Blake Bell package that bring in just this new little dose in the red zone that can be a huge game changer. And I'd love to see, one, for Baker's health reasons, I'd like to see a lot of Kyler Murray in this game against Tulane. He's mine's, exciting. Mine's pretty simple. How about just a 100% good start? UTEP, offense got off to a hot start. Sure. UTEP went right down the field that first they drive. Scored. Defense was sleeping. Ohio State didn't score a touchdown until the second half. Offense and defense, both just start the game already <laughs> like in a rhythm. Just let's get just, the ball yeah. going quick. Let's, just, let's get it going quick. You know, this is Tulane. An inferior opponent, no respect to Tulane, but they're a group of five team. So get out, get this thing ugly early, get the starters out. Well, yeah. You know, that's what I'm wanting to see. Get in, get out, get safe. I agree. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. All right, guys. Well, we're going to take a break, but we will be back later on. We're going to go out to Colin and the guys. Hopefully now they'll do four downs if everything goes to plan. We'll see you guys later on. Welcome back to Game Day U. Good stuff from the studio crew getting into OU a little bit. We'll get on to that later in the show, gentlemen. But for now, we're going into four downs. Four topics, four downs. We're going to hit them all. Let's drive the field a little bit, gentlemen. Let's do it. Drive the field. I love it. But we're going to be off in a little bit of a hurry. So four downs. First down. Should Ohio State think about benching JT Barrett at some point this season? Their options, before we get into it, Dwayne Haskins, a guy, number four ranked pocket passer, coming out of his class, according to ESPN. And also, Tate Martell, one of the, the number six dual threat for ESPN's recruiting rankings. They have options. However, JT Barrett has been around the program for a very long time, led them to some success. Should they think about it? I don't think so. Uh, you can't just jump ship. I think unless JT Barrett just continues to have poor games, like <coughs> worse than what he had last week. If, right. he, if they lose three, four in a row, Maybe consider it, but you can't just jump ship, especially when you've got Penn State and, and Michigan later on in the season. You can't just throw in a guy mm -hmm. like Dwayne Haskins or uh, Tate Martell. Or, yeah, like you mentioned, just out of nowhere and expect him to be any better than what JT Barrett has been. I agree. No, that's that's their guy. JT Barrett has been the quarterback for a long time now. He has done too much good for that program to just bench him. As you said earlier in the show, Oklahoma just did the one thing that they had to do to beat him, and mm -hmm. that is make him one-dimensional. He's not a pocket passer. Right. He is a guy like Lamar Jackson who likes to scramble around and to find the guy late over the middle of the field. You're right. Oklahoma cool. limited him to having to be a pocket passer, and he couldn't do it. He one-hopped guys on eight-yard routes. That's how you beat him. I think that you know, even though they were able to do that, it still doesn't mean that he's not a good quarterback. 
you should know that he's not a good pocket passer. Correct. But he's still a great quarterback, and he's still the leader of this football team. And okay. I agree. I, I don't think you should bench him at all. I don't think you should. Interesting exchange on the Notre Dame sidelines. I don't know if Brian Kelly's First fired up. Look at this. Stripping offense, number 72. He was fired up with. Sorry about the difficulties, guys. We're having problems out there. Um, but so, obviously, the offense played great against Ohio State. We'll see what the offensive guys have been saying all week. Lincoln and the boys, what do they have? We're excited to be back home. Uh, would fully expect that. You know, Saturday night, you know, Norman will be will be really rocking. Should be a great atmosphere, and, and we're excited to uh, get that one teed off and get moving. You know, we talked about in the ride home some of the leaders that, that we need to prepare like that every week, and that's that's just we need to treat every game like it's the last one we have and like we need it. So um, I, I think that's that's a good mentality to have is just block out everything else and prepare like nobody believes in us and, you know, uh, j just go to work. Singular focus. We have to take each each game one week at a time, and that's what we've been doing. That's what we've been preaching for the past couple of seasons, and and we just you know today's Monday starts all over with, with Tulane. Just, I'm, I'm surrounded by a bunch of great athletes, and we have a lot of depth. And so uh, I, like I said, I've had a lot of trust in these guys, and, and I believe in them. So I, when I'm throwing to one guy, uh, it, it feels like I'm throwing to the same guy. If it's somebody else, you know, we just rotate them in. You know, Mark went down, and then you sub in Grant or Lee Morris, and Lee scores. He's got two catches and two touchdowns on the year. So we have a bunch of guys, and we have a lot of depth at receiver, which we haven't had in a long time. Uh, he's just a. Uh... All right, guys. So this week they got Tulane. What are we looking at here with Tulane? Give us a little bit of a preview about Tulane. They have Jonathan Brantley, their backup QB, is starting. They run that triple option. What can we expect today? I'm excited to see triple option play. Yeah, OU it's doesn't fun. get to play against a team that runs the triple option ever. It's pretty much just the military schools and Georgia Tech. Yeah. No one's yeah. run it. First time since we played Air Force at home a few years ago that I think we've seen Remember a triple that. option. It's. I don't think Tulane's good enough to even consider this a trap game. I'm really hoping OU goes out, plays to their fullest abilities at the beginning of the game, gets off to a hot start, mm -hmm. and just ends them early. Uh, but as Kyle was saying, it, it will be fun to watch the triple option. The triple option is a very rare thing to see in college football. Well, so obviously, it'll a be big a big test for the rush defense And the back of the quarterback thing yeah. doesn't really matter because they don't pass. No, yeah, not so. really. They've run the ball on almost 80% of their plays. Yeah. So, obviously, the rush defense is going to get a lot of time. They do throw occasionally. They have, like, 20-something passes in the first two games. So, the cornerbacks need to not fall asleep, sure. I would say, and be ready when they try to take the top off. OU's defense last season did not perform well against quarterbacks who run. JT Barrett running was an issue. Jonathan Brantley last week ran for 88 yards and a touchdown. Yeah. So anytime a quarterback is out there sprinting around, it's just good to see our defense tackling. I would also say Tulane's yeah, got sure. it's good, middle of the good road. Good tackle practice. Tulane's got middle of the road defense. No, it's not going to be totally easy. I mean, through the first two games, they have the 63rd rush defense, and that's with playing Navy last week, who runs the ball every play. Yeah, sure. And then they're 26th in pass defense, so also their top defense. But again, Navy runs the ball every play. So I would say their defense is middle of the road. It's not going to be super easy for mm -hmm. Baker and the company. Maybe. I don't know. We'll I mean, see. This won't be Austin P State. There's no this is not a pushover. But it shouldn't be it shouldn't be tough. If OU comes out and is focused and does what they well, should clearly. be doing, yeah. there should be no issues. This game should be over by halftime. But to Kyle's point, we have had trouble covering running quarterbacks in the past. And I would love to see our defense just come out and shut them down. Use the game to learn. Get your tackling down. Get it all sorted out. Absolutely. Tackle the quarterback. All right, so let's get to everybody's favorite part of the show. Sure. Call-outs, national call-out, Sule. We'll start with you. I'm going to throw it to former OU defensive coordinator Brent Venables. His Clemson team plays Lamar Jackson this week. Mm -hmm. Huge test. And everybody wants to talk about Lamar Jackson, obviously former Heisman or reigning Heisman Trophy winner. Incredible talent. Will they be able to stop his running game? Because he's not known for his throws. He's not known for his arm. He's known for his ability to make plays out of nothing. Just an electrifying player. And over the fast plus last four seasons, Clemson has the best QB Struggling. defense in the national, like on all of college football, based on total QBR. They rush the ball better, rush, rush the quarterback better than anybody in the country. 
Will they be able to get to Lamar Jackson? Will that new defensive front, after they lose a lot of people to the NFL last year, will they be able to not only get to him, but contain him and wrap him up? Because when he's been pressured, he doesn't play as well. That'll be a huge key for Brent Venables to keep his defensive line focused and disciplined to keep Lamar Jackson in the pocket and not be able to make big plays. Absolutely. Spence, what do you got? I think that Sam Darnold and USC need to destroy Texas and just annihilate their team. As I expect them to. Hang 50 on them. Don't let them score. Make it a statement game. Uh, you had a great game last week against Stanford, 42-24. After not looking great, we yeah, won. Yeah. Um, so just solidify where you are and let everybody know that this could be your season. Absolutely. That's a good one. My national call for this week is JT Barrett. Great last one. week. Played horrible. Last week he played horrible <laughs> against OU. For the last three seasons, through so much criticism and people saying he wasn't going to be the quarterback, he's stuck through and been the starter for that team. He sold at 104 touchdowns at Ohio State. And as a senior, he looks like he's on the verge to potentially losing his starting spot. Yeah, He did not look like he freshman. knew how to throw a football yeah. last season. Complete and a pass this week. Yeah. yeah, let's get some passes. My national call out, you mentioned Brent Venables comes to D. I'm going Lamar Jackson. Lamar, this game, you win it, you're back in the Heisman conversation. Louisville is firmly in the college football playoff conversation. Definitely. His draft stock will be really high. They've already been talking about Baker Mayfield as best quarterback in the country. Go make your statement. This is your time, Lamar. National TV game, biggest game you play all year. You're at home. Let's go. I expect to see Lamar Jackson go crazy tonight. And it's a revenge game for him, too. Yeah, they lost last year. Yeah. The game that pretty much just ended Louisville's championship hopes last season. For sure. All right, guys. Let's go stick in Norman this time. Oh, you call out. Who you got, Sule? Uh, I'm calling out Austin Seiber. Missed yes. a 37 yard field goal last week. Bad snap, though. Bad I snap. The snap was bad. I'll give kickers have to make kicks. You have to I'm make giving the him kicks. a pass for the, the laces. Have to make were kicks. back to even but when the kick came, and it should have been made. He's a junior. He's played the last three seasons. He, he is not, he has no excuse at this point. He went 11 of 16 last year with a long of 39. He has the leg. He had a long of 46 his freshman year. It's all in his head, and he needs to get his head in the right place because there's going to come a time. Some point this season where I know we're going to need a field goal in the clutch. He hasn't needed to yet. He's only had to take two field goals so far this season. But at some point, he's going to have to make a field goal. And no one wants to see a Michael Honeycutt situation <laughs> come no. back for the Sooners. So I think he needs to do whatever he needs to do. The coaches need to do whatever they need to do to get him in the right state of mind that he can make that field goal in the clutch. I've got Jeff Bidette. Not because he hasn't been performing, mm. not because he hasn't added a spark, but because I want to see him get in the end zone. I want to see him score, and I want to see him just and not have, have his day in the sun. Yeah, not fumble. Don't do that. True. My OU call it this week is Jeff Mead, another wide receiver named Jeff. Please, Mead, do something. Name, On week one in the show, I said Jeff Mead would become Baker's favorite target, and he has one catch in two games. He's a senior. This was supposed to be his year. Today's the day Baker finds Jeff Mead. He's got to make some catches, or he's not going to be playing anymore. Absolutely. My you call out, I'm going, I'm going Abdul Adams. Um, Abdul lost a starting job to Trey Sermon. Sermon's going to start this game tonight. Um, Sermon played much better against Ohio State. Abdul looked really good against UTEP. Um, I, need, I, I want to see Abdul go show everybody and Lincoln why he was named the starter for week one. He had all offseason, all the summer workouts. He won that job, and it's gone. So... I want to see Abdul Adams do something tonight and get his job back or at least make it a, a really a two-man back. That would just mess up the depth chart sure. even more. Yeah, just make it even more muddled if he goes out there and just plays amazing. It's a, it's a good problem to have for the Sooners to have such talent everywhere. Absolutely. But I think everyone would like for it to be clear. Yeah, for him, he lost his job. I'm calling him out. Let's go. Get it back. Um, all right, so guys, what about your final word for the day, for the game today, Sule? My final word is focus. This game comes down to focus. If the Sooners aren't too focused on the past in this past win against Ohio State, they should be fine. If they're too focused on that and they're living in the moment still, they're still in Columbus mentally, no one wants to come out and struggle against Tulane. We are in a great spot. I mean, the Sooners are in a great spot for the national playoff. Absolutely. Focus is key. And they need to come out, and they need to focus against Tulane and get the job done and move on to the Big 12 play. Spencer. My final word is obliterate. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Go out there that's and a, just that's what a lot obliterate the green wave. Uh, assert your dominance. You have the better talent. You have the better coaching staff. You have the better team. Obliterate them. 
My final word is steady. We mm -hmm. came off, oh, he's coming off a huge win in Columbus. Same with the focus idea. They've got to come in, right mentality, just come in this game, play good offense, play good defense, play steady. we got to keep looking good before conference play. I'm going, my final word is health. And really, I'm saying similar things to what Spencer said. Obliterate them. Make this thing ugly quick. Get sure. Baker. Get all the starters right. out. Don't get injured. No disrespect to Tulane, but they're a group of five team. They're a non-conference team. If at the end of the season, OU has lost somebody significant, Mark Andrews for the year, God forbid, Baker for the year, and they mm. look back and they say, oh, that was in Tulane game. That's going to look really silly that it was the Tulane game where you basically wrecked your season. So, health. Sure. Get out of this game healthy. Yeah. Just Make it ugly. Get get everybody out. Let Kyler play. Let everyone forget about the game. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Let's, let's go ahead and wrap it up pretty quick. All right, guys. Final score. What do you got? Uh, I'm gonna go 52 to 10. Uh, I think OU will come out with a big, big start. Seven touchdowns, one field goal. Hopefully, my OU call out Austin Seibert will uh, come through for me, and then uh, Tulane will get some garbage time in the fourth quarter. Get some points on the board. Absolutely. I have it at 51-9. I know it's such an score. oddball score. It's gonna happen. Just wait. 51-9. Do you trust Cyber to make three field goals, or do you have some different way to get to 51? Uh, I've got a different way. What's, what's the way? Let's hear it. Two point conversions, missed extra point. You'll oh. see it happen. <laughs> so many missed extra points <laughs> that they just start going. That would definitely time. validate my call yeah. out for sure. <laughs> I'm going 54-13. Offense gonna tear it up quickly. Tulane will get a fourth quarter touchdown. Tulane has 54. <laughs> oh, yeah. 54. Sure. Um, so, my final score, I'm going to go 52-7. I think the offense will come out quick. They'll get maybe 35-ish at halftime. Um, I think one of two things is likely to happen. Either OU comes out a little flat because they're coming off a huge win now they're playing a smaller school, and they allow Tulane to get in the end zone early, kind of like UTEP did. Or two, kind of like Sule was saying, garbage time touchdown. I feel like one of the two is very likely to happen. Probably not both, but one of the two is probably going to happen. For sure. I agree. All right, guys, that's all we got. Um, that's it for us in the studio. We're going to finish the show with Colin and the guys. It's been fun. I enjoyed it. Enjoy the game tonight, and we'll be back with Colin and the guys. See you guys. Welcome back to Game Day U. Sorry about those technical difficulties, but we are here in the studio now and ready to get things continued here. Are we ready? Let's, yeah, let's get back this. into let's it. it. We are in four downs. We are on second down, so we're going to get right back into it. Gentlemen, should Brian Kelly or will he be fired before the end of Notre Dame's football season? I think were, were you taking this? Yeah, I'll take this yeah. first. I think I don't I don't believe in firing a coach in the middle of the season. I believe that if you're going to do it, it needs to be after the season, and that's what they should do. Will they do it? I don't know. It's been a lot of mediocrity from this Notre Dame team for a while now, since 2012 when they actually made it the national championship and got smoked by Bama. But Brian Kelly hasn't really accomplished much. And, it, and it's been one of those just – it's kind of been abysmal. Uh, and for that fan base, you have that many fans, that rich of a tradition. When you're not playing well, that's a big problem. And so I think that it's, it's time for them to, you know, move on and, and find a guy who can get things done. You know, I don't, I don't agree that they, they should do it in the, in the middle of the season. But I do believe that it should be done because he just hasn't really progressed ever since they were in that national championship against Alabama. He hasn't done the job, and like we saw with what Texas did to Charlie Strong, they booted him out of there when they weren't getting the job done. And I think the Notre Dame needs to do the same thing. I think it might happen in the middle of the season, but I don't think it should. Mm -hmm. I think it has a chance to happen in the middle of the season, too. They play at Michigan State, uh, at home against USC, at Miami, at Stanford. Those are all four big long, games. Big long, games. Th those, those could be losses for them. Mm -hmm. And who knows? They could also slip up somewhere else, maybe at North Carolina. Mm. I think he's out by, by the season. If not, then right after I agree. the season's yes. over. Absolutely. All right, third down, gentlemen. Josh Rosen had that impressive game against Texas A&M. Is he the best quarterback in the state of California? No. Sam Darnold might say otherwise. No. And you not, apparently he, seem to say he, otherwise as well. He's not the best. Hey, we, we saw it. We all watched him against Texas A&M. Yeah, he made some spectacular plays. But a lot of those plays, you definitely said, it, were a lot based off of luck. It's like Auburn a mm -hmm. couple years ago when they made to the national championship. They had a lot of luck behind them. Yeah. And I think that's what he gets away with a lot. I think he. I don't even think he's top two. Mm -hmm. I think the boy at Washington and the guy at USC Browning? are both. Yes, oh, Jake Browning. Name. You no, no, I year. just didn't. I was speeding through, sir. Jake Browning and Sam Darnold. I think they're both better than this kid, and mm. I, I mean, he's good, but he's lucky. Telling me Chosen Rosen isn't the guy. Uh, I completely agree. I think <laughs> I, you know, as much as it kills me to say, I've been bashing a lot on Sam Darnold. 
of him being overrated. I think that he's better than Josh Rosen. Josh Rosen, like I said, did not look good in that a &M game. He, those passes that, that he had in that comeback were not good passes. Right. It just was just luck. And so I think that, you know, he has two guys ahead of him. That's Browning and Sam Darnold. Mm. I'm going to go the other way. I think, yeah, I think he is. Oh, chosen Sam, really. Sam Darnold has more to work with around him. He's got better tools. And I kind of touched on this earlier. Sam Darnold already has four interceptions through two games. Ball security has been an issue for him so far. Not the same with Josh Rosen. Um, and, but from a pure talent perspective, I think he's better than Sam Darnold. Now, he might not be the best quarterback to us, but I will say he's the most He's the boldest quarterback because if, to put a hot tub in your dorm room, I like that. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty, big, that's that's pretty tight. So yeah, but his move. comments about I, college and playing football, I think that's, that's, his, that, that's, his, that's his only weak side. I think it's his, his it, mental his game and what gotta, he says. Yeah. But I think from a, from a pure talent perspective, if you're a, a pure NFL standpoint, I think he's mm -hmm. a better quarterback than Sam Brown. All right, boys, it's fourth down. We're going for it. Is TCU the Big 12's third best team? Third well, best team. Obviously, I think we could both, we could all say OU, OSU, top two teams in the Big 12. <coughs> I, I think agree. it's a toss up for third between TCU and K State. I'd give the slight edge to, to, um, to TCU. Their defense is legit. Number four in total defense in the country. On offense, Kenny Hill needs to improve a little bit. Mm. But I, I was impressed last week, and I t I've already touched on this uh, earlier today. I was impressed with their win at Arkansas last week, the way they marched into Fayetteville and got the big win. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that, I mean, if you're looking at it, OU, OSU are obviously the top two in the Big 12. But I think TCU and the offensive explosion they had with Kenny Hill and that group of wide receivers, yeah. I think they're easily the third best team right now. Mm. They're, the, they're the team that's going to give OU and Oklahoma State the biggest challenge this year. And so I think that it's going to be, it's, it comes down to them. And I think that with what they can do on the offensive side of the ball, Defense may not, maybe not that great, but what they can do, scoring points, mm. they're the third best team. And that, that was the story coming in. That was the headline coming into the season for TCU, whether or not Kenny Hill could get the job done and whether or not the wide receivers could hold on to the football because that's what they had trouble with last year. They depended a lot on their running backs to carry the team. Mm -hmm. The defense, I think, is really legit. I think they'll slip up a little bit more. I don't I don't think they're the best defense in the Big 12. I think OU has the best defense, mm -hmm. but I do think they're the It's third. not hard to have the best it's, defense in the Big 12. But. It's, it's just hard to have the worst defense, and I think <laughs> Baylor's taking that one right now. But I do think they're the third best team in the Big 12. All right, gentlemen, well, that was four downs. We're off the field in a quick hurry, and now we're headed to the sidelines for a quick break. When we come back, Sooner fans, you're finally going to hear it. We're going to break down some Sooner football. You're going to want to stay with us. This is Game Day U. Welcome back to Game Day U. We're finally into some Sooner football, and I know a lot of you Sooner fans have been waiting for us to talk about it, so let's get right into it. OU's offense had an impressive showing in Columbus against Ohio State, and the face of it all was Mr. Baker Mayfield. Guys, this kid As is on always, top yeah. of the college football world after that game, right? Yeah, I mean, he's the best quarterback in the country, uh, and I think that's maybe without question, um, at least on this panel. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly not the best NFL draft, NFL draft prospect, but just the – qualities that he has, leadership, elusiveness, playmaking ability, his poise, are all what make him the best quarterback in the country. He's completing 83.6% of his passes, six touchdowns to zero interceptions this season. So he's off to a great start, has a signature win in Columbus at the shoe. Uh, so he is the, is the driving force behind this Oklahoma team. I, I think okay. that, you know, saying he's the best QB, that's, I completely agree. But the way Baker plays, you almost have to put him as the best player in the country, the all-around. I agree with that. And I have two things written down. I have one thing, one main word, and that is his confidence. I have not seen a guy play football in a long time or any sport who is as confident as he is, mm -hmm. but also backs up what he says. Yeah. Right. He says it and he does it like it's just it's how, it, how it works. Mm -hmm. And then he was, has the, the nerve to plant the flag in the middle of Ohio Stadium. I mean, we haven't even talked about that yet. It goes to show the kind of how confident he is in himself, but he's just, he's playing so hard. I mean, 84% completion rate right now, mm. I mean, 84%, six touchdowns, no interceptions. He's playing phenomenal. I and mean, he's only played what, a, 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 game, a, game a game and a half. Yeah. Yeah. He's played a game and a half. And so it just goes to show how good of a player he is, and he's going to have a big day today. Yeah, I mm. think he's uh, a spectacular player. I mean, mm. he's, he's definitely led this OU offense. You mentioned that he's probably not the best NFL prototype quarterback, but I think he's the most ideal college quarterback, mm. emotionally, mentally, and physically, I mean, mentally, he's, you said it, he's confident, he's emotional, he's competitive. Right. Physically, 
I mean, uh, let the statistics speak for themselves. Yeah. So with a guy like this, I think he's the perfect quarterback for any program, especially the Sooner offense that loves to run fast, that loves to move the ball up and down the field. And when you've got young guys, you mm -hmm. need a quarterback like that. And when you've got an offensive line that OU Sooners do have, mm -hmm. I mean, it's very difficult to I stop think, anybody. I think that – Two years ago, I would have said, no way Baker Mayfield plays in the NFL. Last year, eh, there's a chance he could see it. This year, I tell you what, he's gotten mm -hmm. bigger. He, his arm strength has gotten better. Yeah. And that was I one of the big he darks could be good. NFL yes. draft, draft you know, scouts mm -hmm. were saying about him is that his, his arm strength wasn't great. And it's, I think you're right. It hasn't proved a, a lot. Cannon. Right. He has a cannon. People are kind of comparing him to Brett Favre or Russell Wilson or Drew Brees. That's pretty good company, yeah. I think. I wouldn't mind me comparing to any exactly. of those guys. But for me, what separates this kid from everyone else in college football are the intangibles. You talk about all the quarterbacks across college football. You look at guys like Sam Darnold, who sort of lead by example, Lamar Jackson, a little bit of a question. Josh Rosen, as we know, man, that kid can get in some trouble with his words. But Baker Mayfield consistently shows the leadership potential week in and week out and keeps his guys in check and gets them ready for a big game or a fairly mediocre game like today's game against Tulane. And I love how he's able to lead his team consistently because they could have easily been rattled against Ohio State when they opened up through the halftime and they went right down the field. But yeah. Baker said, we're still in this game. We're going to go down there and march it, and that's what they did. I love how this kid leads his team. And to me, I'm going to be quite honest, I think he's the face of college football at this moment. There is no one, when they step out on the field, that can impact the game more than he can. Oh, and yeah. I love what this kid can do week in and week out. As a two-time walk-on. <clears throat> As a two-time walk-on. Pretty incredible, on. honestly. And he's all also consistently been in the Heisman Trophy races. What can this kid not when do? When you have that much trust and respect from your head coach, mm -hmm. no matter who it is, it goes to show what type of person you are, but also the type of player you are as well. And mm -hmm. it just goes, I mean, he's just, he's that guy that you, he, he's such, he's so grown up, he's so mature that, you know, Lincoln Riley just, kind of just puts it in his hands to mm -hmm. lead the team. And I think that's really cool. And I was just about to say that Lincoln allows Baker to be himself, not only off the field, but on the field. You see it. You see his personality. You mm. see the type of man he is on the field. And, and I think that's what helps him lead as well. When you can truly be yourself and you can be the type of guy you want to be no matter what, mm -hmm. your team wants to follow you. They, they, they right. want to be behind that because they see you're comfortable and that kind of gives them that sense of and comfort And the university well. trusts him as well. I mean, look, they, they don't censor what he says in the, in the to the media, the press conferences. Mm. He just kind of says it how he feels it. Yeah. And no one's telling him not to do it because they trust him that if he says it, he's going to he's gonna back it up. I think he's good enough to lead Oklahoma to a national championship this year. I really mm. do. And that's what he said before Bedlam last year. He said, I came here for one reason, that's to win a national championship. I think they're And it was in the intro it. video as well. I yeah. know. Got Sooner fans pretty riled up. But when you look at Baker Mayfield, a lot of the questions that were surrounding him were not his overall talent per se but it was who he was going to throw the football to. Now, as we've progressed sort of into the season, there's a young man named C.D. Lamb that has sort of emerged as a guy that a lot of people within the program are very high on. Say he has the potential to be one of the next go-to guys at these university, and as we know, they have a great tradition of top-tier wide receivers here. So my simple question is, is C.D. Lamb the go-to guy for the Sooner offense? Yeah, I don't know if he's the go-to right now. Mm -hmm. I think he's a great wide receiver, and he is getting there. But I think, personally, I think Jeff Bidette is the guy that Baker trusts the most because mm. of all the experience he's had playing D1 football, and that's why Baker goes. I mean, nine receptions, 173 yards. He's had a big first two games. CeeDee Lamb is still young. He's still a true freshman. Give him a little more time. He will be Baker's number one guy. But I think Jeff Bidette is a guy who has the most experience on that receiving core right now, and he's the guy that Baker's going to trust the most. And you, you took the words right out of my mouth. I think C.D. Lamb is great, but I think Jeff Bidette is the number one guy for Baker because he has that sense of trust with him. And you saw in the first game, he just threw it up to him and Je let Jeff Bidette went to go get it. When you trust a guy, you'll do that for your wide receivers. Mm -hmm. Against Ohio State, when Baker needed something to be done from his wide receivers, he trusted Bidette to be, be the guy for right. it. And I think when it comes down to game time situations and serious moments, he puts the ball in his best player's hands, and that's Jeff Bidette for him. Yeah. I think, yeah, I agree with what you guys have said. You guys pretty much took everything I had. The one thing I do want to say, though, about these, these young guys, especially, you know, C.D. Lamb, Lincoln Riley talked about how this freshman class didn't seem like a freshman class because so many of them came in and enrolled early yep. that by the time they got to fall camp that it was just like having, yeah. you know, 
I just it's just like another team. Like mm -hmm. you, you don't have. It's not like you have new guys. I mean, you do, but it, it doesn't seem like that in practice and in games. And CD mm -hmm. Lamb certainly is as at the, I think at the head of that. And that and that's what helped with those guys coming in early. It kind of built that brotherhood, right. that connection, which allowed them to really be very consistent and mm -hmm. very relaxed and poised going into Week One. And like we saw last week, Week Two against Ohio State. Absolutely. Yeah. And to back up your guys' points, as far as Jeff Bidet being the go-to guy, this guy's been on the big stage several times. Grad transfer from Kentucky. He's played in those big time SEC games and naturally you're going to want to go to the guy that's been there done that before yeah. so right now I would say Jeff Bidette is the go-to guy but to be quite honest in my opinion I don't think this offense needs a go-to guy and th this offense is so well structured and Lincoln Riley is so good at spreading the ball out that you don't need someone for to focus on in the receiving core Dimitri Flowers had one heck of a game. He was yeah. the leading receiver. Yeah. And he's the fullback. <laughs> fullback. And he's the fullback. <laughs> what an offense this is. I don't think you need a go-to guy on the stage. Mm -hmm. I think Mark Andrews early on seemed to establish, then Jeff Bidette. But it, to be quite honest, we overlook the fact that guys like Dimitri Flowers had a heck of a game. And that's what this offense is right now. I don't think you need when, that go-to guy When you have one of the stage. best offensive minds in the country <laughs> who just so happens to be the head coach, it's you. It's you can't prepare for that offensively. Mm. You can't just say, "Okay, we're going to stop this guy. We're going to stop this guy." Because if if you have a guy like Lincoln Riley, it's every guy that you have to worry about. And that's what gave Ohio State fits. That's what Week One gave fits to that team as well. I forgot their name as well already. But <laughs> UTEP. Yeah, I know. Yeah, there we go. Sorry, it's been a long, been a long <laughs> week. But yeah, it's it, still it, early. It's, 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 still it is, early. it's still early. But and I, I think that's what's going to give fits for the rest of the Big 12 and Tulane today. It's as well. weird how it, it, it polar opposite seasons. Last year, OU had one guy to throw to. That was D.D. Westbrook. Mm -hmm. He just literally lit up the scoreboard. This year, you have 14 different guys who are mm -hmm. catching footballs, yeah. and I think it just goes to show the difference in coaching. Lincoln Riley is a guy who likes to shred the ball out, score a lot of points, right. go, 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 offense, offense, offense. And that is showing with the amount of guys, that young guys, old guys, transfers that are getting the football right now. And mm -hmm. that's, just, that's just how Lincoln Riley is, I think. I would agree. Well, we talk about the spread of the offense, but it's hard to spread the ball out at the running back position. However, coming into the season, OU had three to four guys that could have potentially carried the load for the Sooners. Then one young man emerged as the go-to guy in Columbus. That's Mr. Trey Sermon out of Georgia, the freshman. We talked about it, Carson, yeah. mentioned earlier. This freshman class is getting involved early, and suddenly Trey Sermon seemed to solidify himself as the number one back, and it was announced the other day, he's number one on the depth chart going into this game. Guys, did he earn it? I think he did. It's As, as a true freshman, to march into Columbus and perform the way he did, it, it took a couple guys, Abdul Adams, you know, with, with the fumble, Rodney Anderson being thrown in there a little bit, mm -hmm. but once once Trey Sermon got in there, we kind of we saw what Lincoln Riley and Bob Stoops and Kale Gundy saw out of him mm -hmm. coming out of high school out of Georgia, and he he lit it up, and I think he's going to be OU's next you know excellent star running back. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, I can look back to Monday when you know Baker was talking in the press conference about how Trey Sermon is a guy who's very calm during the week, but when he was at Ohio Stadium last weekend. It was like he flipped the switch, and it was just focused, fired up, and ready to just beat these guys. He's a guy like that. He's a guy who's very calm during the week. Mm -hmm. Off the field, he's just very chill. But when the light shining on him in those big moments, he's a guy who can turn it on. And that's what the Sooners need. Abdul Adams had a, his chance to be the guy getting the start, fumbled the football. Rodney Anderson still cannot find you know any kind of consistency running the football. Marcelo Sutton, a guy who didn't really get any touches at all, but that was because Trey Sermon kind of did it all. But he's mm -hmm. averaging, you know, five yards a carry nearly. I think Trey Sermon is, is, is the future for this team. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. For me personally, I think it's better if, you, if you're a coach, if, you, if you're a teammate, to see a guy like Trey Sermon surge against a team like Ohio State. Mm -hmm. Now, if he would have done it against UTEP or if he does or were to do it today against Tulane, mm -hmm. you, you would be like, okay, he's got talent. But how will he fare in a big mm -hmm. game? The fact that he did it in a big game, now you know what he's capable of against top opponents, against top teams. And with that being said, mm. I think he's the top guy. Rodney Anderson, I think he's still trying to get a feel for football for being out so long. I agree. But I do think that Sermon, with the way he played, how emotional, I mean, he was very excited about mm. the game. When he scored that touchdown, he was more almost more excited than Baker was. Yeah. And so. And that for, takes a lot. Yeah, yeah it really <laughs> does. And, and you really saw him 
really kind of leave his mark, not only at Ohio State, mm. but on the Sooner football team. I agree, and I want to real quick point out that Lincoln Riley, early on, we talked to them in practice. Lincoln Riley said Trey Sermon was the big kid in high school. He wasn't really formed into a college running back build, and now that he's looking the part, man, he is a complete back, can catch the football, bullied Ohio State defenders all around the field, and made some great elusive plays. Love the way he played. But another team or a group that played extremely well was that OU defense. They're playing with a newfound confidence up front and in the back end, and now they're ready to take on a unique triple option attack from Tulane. Let's hear what they had to say about it. Heck, you've seen how Oboe's been playing. You've seen how our D-line's been playing. You've seen the pressure, the time that quarterbacks really haven't had much to throw. And, and I, it's been huge for us on the back end just because, granted, we've stepped our game up tremendously. But at the same time, with them stepping their game up, there's more, there's less time for them to throw the quarterbacks to have time to throw the ball. And, and when they do, it's Aaron passes. And yeah, a lot of discipline. Uh, you know, these guys run the, you know, the triple option a lot of different ways. and. You know, they're really good at it, and, you know, it'll be a great test of our discipline and our structure of our defense and, and making sure we get people, you know, somebody on the quarterback, somebody on the dive, somebody on the pitch. I mean, that, those that's option football. We, we forget everything we learned last week, you know, and we, we start studying on the next on the, the next team, and we just, you know, you get, you're going to have to be disciplined playing this option team. You just watch film, see what they do, just like we would every week. You know? The mentality of that group right now, is probably you know the the biggest thing that stood out the mentality and the leadership. I mean, it's our scheme last year was good, and you know, our scheme this year is good. I mean, everybody's got good schemes, you know, and so uh, Mike and them do a great job, but they've they've done an even better job again with their with our guys' heads, you know, and just making sure that we're in the right frame to play great team defense and to play the type of defense that this university's been known for for a long time. And so, uh, and and we get a group that takes it personal right now. All right, welcome back. We're going to go into that OU defense now. And as I mentioned earlier, they're playing with a newfound confidence, especially up front. Man, did they dominate that Ohio State offensive line and JT Barrett. They made them look bad. As yeah. big and as physical as that O-line was, they are looking good, Carson. I, th I think they were, too. I think Neville Gallimore inside has been yes. outstanding oh through two games. Very physical inside. And then, like, we, you know, we've already talked about a lot. You talked about him. Oboe off the edge. He can play off the edge or he can drop back in, in coverage. Uh, and I think it's very good. Young linebackers, Caleb yes. Kelly, Kenneth Murray. We talked to Kenneth Murray uh, on Tuesday. And he's, he's confident. He's, he's got the hang of things. And let's not forget about Emmanuel Beal. He has been all over yes. the field, leading OU in tackles. Um, and, and he also has um, two tackles for loss and uh, half a sack. So he's just mm. been incredible. Russ yeah. McNeil. Yeah, that's exactly. That's, that's, that's I agree. That two words. I that's, agree. That's why I describe this. <laughs> that front seven right now is playing lights out. I mean, you go in, you go into Columbus and you can put on a performance like that and stop an Ohio State offense. A lot of those guys will be NFL players pretty soon. But Gallimore, like you just said, Neville Gallimore, big day. Mm. Devonta Lampkin, who's not even on the depth chart, mm. comes in. Has a huge game. Uh, over to uh, Marquise Overton and uh, Matt Romar, two guys yeah. who are also playing very well. And then yeah. you have the linebackers. We talked about them a lot. Obo, premier pass rusher. He's, yeah. he's going to be one of the best in the country pretty soon. Agreed. But his ability to not only get to the quarterback, like you said, drop back and, and, and play coverage, that's really impressive. Caleb Kelly, you know, we'll talk about him later on in the show, but he's a guy who's just so physically gifted. And him being so young, and you have Emmanuel Beal, who's one of the most underrated players on the entire defense mm -hmm. in the country. And it just goes to show how deep this team is right now. And you have Kenneth Murray, a true freshman starting at middle, middle linebacker right now. Mm -hmm. Look how he's playing. I mean, yeah. talk about talent right now. Good we talk about Obo getting pressure on the quarterback, talk about him being able to drive back. But his ability to move sideline to sideline, you showed me a clip last week where he ran, what, they threw a screen pass. He blasted through, ran about 20 yards to the, to the left, blasted through a wide receiver, and just made the tackle. Yeah. The wide receiver never had a chance, and he does it to offensive he's, linemen on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. He's so strong. I don't think there's an ounce of fat on that guy. <laughs> on the other end, though, D.J. Ward had a really big yeah, game against Ohio State. Mm -hmm. I heard his name almost as much as I heard Emmanuel Bill's name uh, first week against UTEP. Mm -hmm. He had a really big game. Yeah, I know you're going to talk about Caleb Kelly. He needs to step up a little more. I, I love his confidence, but I need to see 
that transition. I was going to get play. into that later. Yes, so I know. So that. I didn't take it. I said I said like five words. But Kenneth Murray, you you were really excited about him going into this season. How much he and grew he's proven from it. what yeah, about two fifteen to about two forty five. I want to say he was the sixth lowest ranked recruit in that class. And he was six foot two, two seventeen. Now he's six foot two, two hundred forty two. I bet he's not the lowest recruit now. I bet they re- yeah. <laughs> regret ranking him that low now. Absolutely. And Emmanuel Bill is he's been playing well. Mm-hmm. This front seven, how physical they are, I think that's the statement they wanted to make. And that's mm-hmm. why they switched to a four three so they could play teams like Ohio State mm-hmm. and teams out of conference that they would be able they're to get pressure. This and four they are three. loving it because yeah. it especially when you're on the line, it allows you to be more physical. It mm-hmm. allows you to do more things to get to the quarterback. Mm-hmm. Ovo's definitely loving it. DJ Ward's getting into it as well. You know what I want to mention here is we talk about that four three. I think that a lot of people are assuming they're going to a pure four three. However, Mike Stoops mentioned in that post-game press conference, it's not a true 4-3 system. It's almost a multiple yes. style where they have the Jack backer down low, but it's almost a 3-4, 4-3 mix, bringing in the nickel as well. The multiple dimensions that they're able to use on defense because their players are so multi-dimensional themselves yeah. almost confuses opposing offenses, and I think that's exactly what happened. But you talked about Ruffin McNeil. I want to say two words. Mike Stoops. Man, that kid was impressive. He has, He's older he, than you. He, I want to say, I like okay. to say kid where I'm All proud right. of people. I'll tell you what right now, that those words have not been said in about five years. That's yeah, what I want to exactly. say. Mike Stoops has always been under fire at his job position, and he was expected to do something big in that game. And, man, was he good. Called a perfect game. Blitz packages were right on time. Really impressed with him. But I love when I yeah. love when they utilize the nickel package. Yeah. And, and OU does it very – because you have so many guys. You have Chance Silva. You have guys like that Khalil Houghton who can come in and run that nickel package. Mm-hmm. It's so dangerous because yeah. all those guys can mm-hmm. blitz and get to the quarterback, but all of them are great in coverage. And you yeah. talked about Mike Stoops. After the game, when they were in the middle of the field, I, I watched him and listened to him. I was eavesdropping for some reason. Mm-hmm. Talked to Stephen Parker. We'll get to that a little bit later. Mm -hmm. And he was like, look, I was the reason we lost last year and got throttled against Ohio State last Mm -hmm. year in Norman. This y'all, y'all did this for me this season, and I mean it's probably one of the best games he's ever coached. On now defense. you mentioned a little bit about the secondary. A lot of the time, the question mark within the secondary is the cornerback opposite of Jordan Thomas, and that guy, Mr. Parnell Motley, went into Columbus and shut people down. Had a pick, was very impressive shutting down Ohio State wide receivers. Should have had two picks. Yeah, should, should have, have had, had two. He was very impressive in that game. Guys, what are your thoughts on Parnell Motley? He had a really big game, and he really stepped up. I, mm-hmm. I, I love him. I, I, I don't think you OU's – yeah, yeah, I, I love, love him. watching him That's play. That's Yeah, I, I, I you know, I see it hearts and minds, right? No, but <laughs> – Yeah. Ovo, I, I Ovo? Really, That's big. I know, right. I, I, th- I think you've said that Ovo has – no fat on his body every show this. I probably have. There's none. I'm sorry. Kind of weird. I'm always amazed. It's he's huge. Anyways, let's get back to the cornerbacks. <laughs> he's uh, this kid's absolutely amazing. I don't think OU's had a cornerback like this in a while. Even when Zach Sanchez was here, I don't think he was that type of player. Parnell's. I'm gonna get type players. I'm gonna get in your face. I'm gonna talk as much trash as I can possibly can. I'm gonna do whatever it takes to get under your skin, and then I'm gonna make you look like a horrible athlete. And that's what he did to all the wide receivers that stepped in front of him against Ohio State. I watched him get into so many altercations during the game. And when you when you get that type of gritty player, mm-hmm. you love it. Because as long as they back it up, it's worth it. And, he, I mean, we saw against Ohio State, he definitely backed it up. They went to him a lot more than they did towards Jordan Thomas. But, I mean, he held his ground very well. I think a big part yeah. of what makes a quarterback a good quarterback is their ability to play man defense. Yes. And Parnell Motley is the type of guy who is so aggressive and so, you know, in your face that he makes – he completes that secondary for the Sooners. Mm-hmm. He's a guy who will he, – he's physical. He gets exactly. fired up, but he's also a ball hog. And he's shown that already with those mm-hmm. should have been two picks. If Lincoln Riley would have challenged that, if the game would have been closer, he would have <laughs> had two easily. And so, I mean, he's just it, – it's, it's cool because, you know, you have on, on JT's side, they're not really throwing to him right now. No. Kind of all the pressure's on Parnell Motley. And he's coming in here – and he's proven what we've heard all summer long, that he is the guy. He is this good. And he's just backing that up. Well, they're making other offenses have to rethink not going to Jordan Thomas. They're, they're having to say, look what Parnell Motley's done. Yeah. You know, he started this this rise, this campaign back in the spring game when he had that pick on, in, on Baker Mayfield and had one, we already mm-hmm. mentioned this, uh, last weekend against Ohio State, should have had two. And so he's just on this meteoric rise up to – Maybe OU's best cornerback. 
Do I want wow. to say that? <laughs> Maybe. I mean, I mean, Jordan Thomas, he certainly is very talented, and I, I don't think we've got a chance to see a lot because, like we said, no one throws on that side. Uh, and so he does good in coverage and stuff like that, but he doesn't get a chance really to see how well he does, you know, with the ball on his it side. Is, it is huge for OU to be able to go into Big 12 play next week after this Tulane game yeah. and have two guys and not have a weak side. Yeah, because you're, you're every team yeah. always has one guy and then the weaker guy. Mm -hmm. OU right now has mm -hmm. two guys that are both the strong guys. And so playing a Big 12 offense who throws the ball a ton, mm -hmm. that's huge. Mm -hmm. When you talk about strong guys, Kenny, you con consistently oh, mention that there's no body fat on Mr. Elmo Ronco. None. Well, I'm going to ask you the same question. I think I already know your answer. My answer. Is Mr. Oboe the best pass rusher in the Big 12, and is he the best pass rusher in the country? You this know. is biased because they're friends. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But, you know, I, I, I mean, I've already talked about him like five times yeah, today. Right. So I don't have too much. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I, I mean, all I have to say, I think he's the best pass rusher in the Big 12, but I don't think he's quite the best pass rusher in the country yet. I think it's going to take a few more games. I think Bosa for Ohio State is up there as well. There's a few guys that I would maybe put in front of him, but I think at the end of the season, like I said, I think he's going to be an All-American if he continues this play, and I think he's possibly going to be the best pass rusher in the, in the country. Mm. He's I certainly the best pass rusher. Sorry not to interrupt you, but uh, all you. he's certainly <laughs> the best pass, pass rusher in the Big 12, but I, I would agree I don't think he's the best in the country. I think you kind of mentioned this guy earlier, uh, Boston College defensive end Harold Landry. That's my guy. Number nine in um, – S size preseason top 100 players, a top 10 for a defensive end. That's pretty good. Uh, like, like you said earlier, uh, led the nation last year in sacks, 16 and a half, seven mm -hmm. forced fumbles. And then you have a couple other guys: NC State DN Bradley Chubb, uh, Michigan DN uh, Rashawn Gary, and Clemson DN um, Klein Farrell. Yeah. Um, Cleveland Farrell. Cleveland good. Farrell. Yeah. yeah. Excuse me. Sorry. Yeah, um, so there's just a there's there's a handful of guys, and I think you're right. Ogo has to he has mm -hmm. a little bit. Of you know work to do to become the best pass rusher. Yeah, Reagan, real quick. I completely, I mean, I completely agree. You guys basically took everything I was going to say. Sorry. He's, he's kind of, he's obviously the best in the in the Big Twelve right <laughs> now. I think that he's getting to be the best. I mean, he's only played two games this year. He has two and a half sacks. That's great. He has ten tackles. He can do a lot on the football field, but he's got to keep this going. Mm -hmm. and, and if he can keep this going, get a Big Twelve play, mm -hmm. and be lights out even more, he has a chance to be the best pass rusher in the country. Best pass rusher, not yet, but best defensive end that might be the case for him because he can be all yeah. over the field like we were saying yeah. earlier. And I don't think there's a, really another defensive end that can do that. If he has to get to the quarterback, he can. But if he has to guard a tight end or something like that, he's able to do yeah. that as well. And if he has to move sideline to sideline. He just has that line, body style, yeah. though. He's, 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 he's so not, athletic. He's, he's not a, too big where mm -hmm. he can't cover, but he's also big enough where he'll lay the wood on you. He's a freak yeah. of nature. All right, well, that was your breakdown of OU's defense. They got a big game against Tulane, and we're going to wrap up our show with final words, score predictions, and call-outs. You're going to want to stick around. Don't miss it. This is Game Day U. Welcome back to Game Day U, our final segment of the day. We're going to have some fun right here, boys, so let's get it started. Starting it off with your national call-out. I know a lot of people are ready for this one. Carson, what do you have for us? All right, my national call-out. Baylor, are you kidding me? <laughs> you are the one who's bringing the Big 12 down. You lose to Liberty? Are you kidding me? You have got to be better. Matt Rule, I think he might be the guy who can turn this around. He seems like a, you know, one of the better coaches that they've tried to hire post-Art Bryles. But you've got to get your guys ready to play. You have Big 12 play coming up. You're not going to win many games in there, and you can't afford to lose to Liberty in non-conference. Be better. Mm. The Big 12 is counting on you. All right. Reagan, All right. what well, do you have I'm for going us? to stay in the Big 12. Tom Herman. We hear all this talk about you. You were the top star at Houston. You are bringing that program up. Now you're at Texas. You've got quite the big pay raise. You lost to Maryland. Not Maryland. Okay. You lost to Maryland. Ooh. You, you, beat the, you beat the heck out of San Jose State, but now you've got USC. Now it's a big challenge. Can, can you keep things going and beat a big team? Can, can you All this talk you've had about how good the program is going to be now, all these new rules you're implementing at Texas, can you, can you keep things going and turn this team back into how Texas should be? And that's a good program. Texas Football is fun when Texas is playing well, and right now they're not playing well. So here's your chance. Hmm. 
feel like that's been the theme for us, like football's fun, we, but we, this team's good. We've all this, called out we, Tom Herman uh, once. This. We've all called out so many teams for saying, oh, they need to be good because that's when football's fun. That's probably our theme for the year, honestly. Mm -hmm. My call out, I don't really have a beef with him, but I kind of want to see what this kid can do. Kelly Bryant, quarterback for Clemson. You got a big game today, man. You had a great first week. Oh, you, no. I'm usually serious. Glad Kenneth I'm told laughing. him. Yeah, you he wouldn't have known. Yeah, he wouldn't have known. You, you played really well week one. You won the game for, for Clemson against Auburn last week with the two rushing touchdowns, but you're going to have to do a lot more today, but if you want to have a chance remotely against Lamar Jackson because he's one of the best quarterbacks in the country. He's a former Heisman Trophy winner, potentially another one this year. So your defense is great. But you've got to be great. So mm. let's see what you can do today, big boy. All right. Well, my call out, gentlemen, isn't even on the football field at all. No coaches, no players. It's ESPN college football analysts. Gentlemen, I remember watching college game day a couple of weeks ago, and you all were going through your Big 12 championship picks, your playoff picks, and a whole lot more. I remember being sitting there and seeing you call Oklahoma pretenders while you picked teams like Miami. Stanford, and more, Wisconsin, to not only make the playoffs over them, but to win the national championship. But that isn't what even bothered me the most. You picked Oklahoma State, Oklahoma State, and TCU to win the Big 12 over Oklahoma, and Joey Galloway picking Baylor, and then saying that Baker Mayfield hasn't had to make any tough throws. And now we're sitting here. Oklahoma's fresh off a win over Ohio State in Columbus, and I haven't heard one apology. Gentlemen, if you're going to be out there analyzing college football and making these terrible calls, you might be seeing the future of ESPN because we're <laughs> coming for your like job. That call out. I like I it. I like that call hey, out. Be better. Yes. I, I, think, I think if they're going to force Baker to have a formal apology for planting a flag, they need to have the ESPN analyst give one for ignorance. I think I think ESPN just sat down, sat down Joey Galloway this year and said, I want you to be the most hated guy on sports television. Well, he's definitely and he's up doing there. It. He's doing that very well. All right, gentlemen, real quick, we're going to go through our last couple ones. OU call-outs. What do you have for us, Carson? Trey Sermon, this is your chance, big boy. I agree. You have a shot to become OU's permanent starting running back. Show what you can do today. Mine's Caleb Kelly. It has to be. I mean, a guy, we talked a lot about Emmanuel Beal, talked a lot about Oboe. Caleb Kelly is a guy who is probably the most physically gifted guy on that defense. You haven't really done much yet this year. It's your time against Tulane before in a Big 12 play. Here we go. We talked a lot about Parnell Motley, but the guy who hasn't gotten a lot of attention is Jordan Thomas. There's a reason for that, because you're a heck of a football player. But don't fall asleep, because they are going to come to you once they start realizing mm -hmm. that Parnell's just as good, if not better than you. So you got to keep your head up. you got to stay focused, and you got to be ready for them to be the target, for you to be the target to other teams. My call out is Mr. Ben Powers, guy on the offensive line. Cody Ford went down in Ohio State, and then you stepped in, and you played pretty well. Then Cody Ford was back from injury, and he suddenly took over your job. Well, now Cody Ford's banged up. You're back in. Prove to us that you are the deserving starter at left guard, and you're here on that star-studded offensive line for good. Go out and prove it today against Tulane. All right, final words for today's game. Carson. I'm going to go maintain. OU's got to maintain their level of play that they had last week in Columbus. I know it's Tulane, but going into Big 12 play, you have to maintain this level of play as the number two team in the country if you want to be respected. Mine's similar to Carson's. It's, it's improve. Yes, you beat Ohio State. Yes, that's great and all. But do not waste a game like this. It's your last non-con game before you head into Big 12 play. This is a chance to improve. This is a chance for young guys to get better. Utilize a game like this. Utilize a non-conference opponent. And that's today. You know, I think we're all pretty similar with our words and our reasons. But I took my word from Friday Night Lights. Best I, show best of show. All time. Coach Taylor talked about standard. We have a standard, and you set the standard of play against Ohio State last week. Leave it at that standard, and like you said, improve. But your standards are high right now. Raise the bar, continue those high standards, and hopefully you can make the national championship. Clear eyes, full hearts, can't lose. Can't lose. You can't lose, especially when you go out and solidify every single position group on the field, and that is my final word, solidify. This is your last chance, OU, to solidify each position group, answer some questions surrounding your football team, and head into Big 12 play confident in what you bring on the field. Go out there, find who deserves to be out there on the field. Offensive line question marks. Make sure Trey Sermon is your guy at running back. 
find maybe a sure go-to guy when things get tough. And from there, you'll head into Big 12 play very confident about what you bring, and you'll contend for a Big 12 championship. All right, final score predictions for today's game against Tulane. Gentlemen. I'm going to go OU 52, Tulane 14. Another big day for Baker Mayfield, I think. Blow out. I'm saying OU 60, Tulane 7. Not wow. a chance for the Green Wave. Baker's going to go all out today. Probably play a half again. Probably have 400 yards passing. <laughs> Trey Sermon might have 150, 200 yards. Big offensive day for the Sooners. I think, I think Lincoln's going to keep him focused and you know, keep things going. Dominance. I mean, just absolute dominance. I'm going 65 OU to lane 10. That's period. I, I haven't gotten to pick sooner 60 plus all season, even though it's only been two games. I think they're just going to air it out. And I, I think Baker might even only play a quarter and a half. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to go lower on the wow. ball. Sorry, Sooner really. fans. All right, well, my final score prediction 56 7. OU defense has faced a lot of run offense early on. This will be a good test for them facing a triple option attack from Tulane. Tulane's starting quarterback, keep in mind, will be out of this game at first. Their backup will be in. That causes plenty of run option attack today for Tulane. OU will have to prepare for that. Get ready for a 56-7 score. All right, well, thank you very much for watching Game Day U. For all of us, Carson Williams, Reagan Ledbetter, and Ken Adair, I'm Colin Kennedy saying thank you very much. We'll be live in Waco next week. You're going to want to tune in as we preview Baylor and OU. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.